everybody. Welcome to the IIBMST Bob Barlow Vision Research Symposium. Uh, I've spoken about IIBMST so many times over the last two days that I'm not going to do it again here. Uh, but the Technion and the NCKU delegations are all here in the front rows, and I hope during the break you'll introduce yourselves to them. So this particular symposium is in honor of Bob Barlow. And Bob Barlow was the driving force behind the vision research group here at Upstate. He was a pioneer with the SUNY Eye Institute and a good friend for many of us. And uh, we miss him. And therefore, this is in his honor. I would like to introduce John Hepner, who will be the MC for this particular symposium. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. I tend to drift away from the microphone. If I fade out, uh, let me know in the back and I'll put on the throat mic. First of all, Steve, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to arrange a symposium to honor Bob. Uh, it's very much appreciated by everyone. Bob had an extraordinary life and an extraordinary career. He established his scientific credibility using Limulus at a time when many in the scientific community had abandoned this particular model for learning more about the visual system. However, this unconventional move proved to be a good strategy for Bob, as he was able to continue to work this model and derive a lot of scientific information from it. <coughs> Bob realized, however, that at some point, he had to make a change from traditional electrophysiology to utilizing the tools of molecular biology. So Bob began working with Barry Knox here at Upstate Medical Center University at, a, at the same time that Syracuse University began to de-emphasize the College of Engineering. Uh, the way it was structured at <coughs> Uh, Syracuse University was the Institute for Sensory Research fell not under the biological sciences but under the College of Engineering. And when it was decided that that was not going to be one of the pillars that they were going to emphasize, Bob thought he needed to look around and find some place to go for what remained of his career. Uh, if it weren't for Barry, he wouldn't have uh, decided on Syracuse University. There was, however, one other factor and that was his wife, Pat. When Bob started looking around for other places to go after Syracuse University, Pat announced to him that she had no intention of leaving and going any place. If he were to leave, he was welcome to come home on the weekends. So between Barry and Pat, uh, we were lucky enough to have Bob come here. Bob was a consummate scientist. <clears throat> he gave generously of his time uh, to everyone. It wasn't unusual to have high school students in the lab. He would devote hours to going over very basic biological principles with students. And this was all the way up to fellow faculty, often in other departments, who would come to Bob and with a problem that needed a solution. Or they were writing a paper, and it just didn't sound right. Or the specific aims page of a new R01 just didn't have the pizzazz that they were used to seeing in Bob's submissions. So he spent an extraordinary amount of time doing that. <clears throat> there wasn't anybody on the faculty that worked harder than Bob. In fact, for years, there was a sign in the laboratory, it's not luck, it's hard work. And that really uh, set it all for Bob. When Bob came here from Syracuse University, there was a small nucleus of vision scientists already here. Um, this expanded tremendously with uh, the work of Bob and Barry. Coordinating and building a center requires not only scientific expertise, but also the ability to communicate with people at all levels. I've told you about the students. 
Bob also worked very well with groups in the community. Over a period of 10 years, we raised $7 million from a combination of private donations, uh, contributions from other organizations, and uh, other entities. This is Bob with a, the, one of the Lions groups. We have done an extraordinary number of Lions tours over the years and participated. Not just Bob, but basically everybody in the center takes part in these exercises. In fact, the group is very tolerant of me. If someone shows up in my office and they talk about the center, I might pick up and give them five minutes notice for a quick lab tour. It's worked out very nicely. Personal relationships, in addition to science, are, are really critical in somebody's career path. Um, on the left in this picture is Paul Seaving. Paul Seaving for years was at the University of Michigan and was an active collaborator with Bob and many other people on the faculty here. Paul went on to become head of the National Eye Institute and has done an outstanding job. Now, knowing Paul Seaving doesn't get you a grant, doesn't get you entree that way. However, uh, this type of relationship doesn't hurt, especially in crunch situations. Greg Eastwood is the, the uh, rather short fellow on the right. Uh, Greg is the one that was president when Bob made the transition over here, and he made everything smooth. Without him, I don't think this transition would have taken place. Personal relationships again. The person, uh, other than Bob and me, is David Weeks. David Weeks is chairman of the Board of Research to Prevent Blindness. Next to him is Diane Swift, who's president of Research to Prevent Blindness. This particular private foundation funds more vision research than any other entity outside of the National Eye Institute. It was started by Jules Stein, who was trained as an ophthalmologist, but he always had an interest in music. In fact, during medical school, he had a dance band. And <clears throat> I'll shorten a very long story, but this interest in music overwhelmed his interest in ophthalmology. And Dr. Stein didn't make his money playing music. He realized that he could make a lot more money if he became a booking agent for other bands, which he did, and established the Music Corporation of America. He was housed in Chicago at the time and actually had to go head to head with the mafia because they also wanted to control this access to music. <clears throat> Jewel Stein never forgot ophthalmology. He set up Research to Prevent Blindness uh, to fund departments of ophthalmology around the country. There are 148 departments, and they fund 48 of us. They have provided a very large chunk of money to get people started, to continue funding when there are gaps in funding through the National Eye Institute, and really have played a critical role in vision research throughout the United States. Um, when Bob became seriously ill with leukemia, uh, we always talked at least once a day. Sometimes uh, at that point in time, it was multiple times a day. On one of these encounters, Bob looked at me and he said, you know, there are two things that are important in my life, the science and my family. This is a picture taken at the Barlow compound in the kitchen that we often had informal little uh, visitations out at, out at Bob's house. Uh, Bob has three children, multiple grandchildren, and has an extremely close-knit family. Bob also had an ability to have a good time. He enjoyed himself in science immensely, <coughs> but he also had a number of hobbies, uh, one of which was scuba diving. There are several of us here at the university that would dive together. This is the last picture that was taken when we went down as a group, taken on Grand Turk Island. Um, and it's a very nice way to remember Robert and to dedicate this symposium to Bob and his life in science. Our first speaker is Professor Ito Perlman. 
whom I met for the first time yesterday. We had a very interesting exchange, and it's, it's a very small world indeed. Professor Perlman has spent several different tours of duty here in the United States, one of which was at the University of Michigan where he obtained his PhD. The second was a sabbatical at the Moran Eye Institute in Salt Lake City. Um, during the time that Professor Perlman was in, at the Moran, he ran into a young fellow named Eduardo Celesio, and <clears throat> they formed a relationship that has lasted through, the, through time. The Moran Eye Center has recently done an interesting thing, and I don't think I discussed this with you last night. The Moran family just gave Randy Olson $10 million with instructions to continue to build their research enterprise. Um, it's already strong. It obviously will be much stronger. Professor Perlman, I want to thank you for taking the time to come all the way to Syracuse to participate with the IIIBMST first meeting and also in this symposium honoring Bob Barlow. Uh, if we could have a warm welcome, and I won't be up here tonight. in vision research because uh, he's still of this, the generation of the Renaissance researcher where the visual system was really the lab, the visual system and the family, of course. Uh, so he could do research on limulus, uh, putting cameras on their head and letting them swim to know how uh, behavior and sensory system work together. And he did in the last few years uh, mouse genetics and uh, retinal metabolism. And these are different uh, areas and uh, very exciting ones. So he was really one of those rare sons. And that's why I devote this talk <coughs> in his memory. And what I'm going to do is to do a little bit what is now called system neurobiology uh, how the retina works and how the retina performs under different conditions. Um, just for those of you who are not that much familiar with the retina, uh, we can have here, this is a section of a, a human retina, and this is a schema, scheme showing the retina, and the retina is composed of several uh, layers of cells, these are the photoreceptors, which are the most important one. When you say photoreceptor, it means it, this is a cell that's responsible to collect, to absorb light and turn it into electrical activity. For those of you who are not in neuroscience, the, the, our central nervous system works only on electrical activity. Not, we don't see in the brain, we don't hear. We have electrical activity which we perceive as light, as picture, or as sound, or as smell, and so forth. So the photoreceptors are the ones who are responsible to do what we call the phototransaction, turning, them, turning the light into electrical activity. And then we have other cells these are horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, ganglion cells, and the ganglion cells talk to the brain. And from then on, the brain is dealing with the visual system, and eventually there'll be perception. But everything starts here, in the retina. If the retina doesn't work, we will not see. If the retina works well, we'll see quite well. Um, the retina is also arranged in a way that, in our eye, that the light, when the light enters the eye, it comes from the outside, goes through the cornea, through the lens, and then hit the retina. It goes all the way across all the, f the cells, absorbed here in the photoreceptors, electrical activity here, and then there is, there is electrical activity moving down the retina to the ganglion cells and then to the brain. Um, what I'm going to talk today is only 
on the first part of the retina. I'll talk, as a matter of fact, all the talk will be about photoreceptors and horizontal cell as a model. And it's a model of system neurobiology, how cells talk to each other in order to do best under different conditions. And when I mean different conditions, I mean what do we do in dark adapted situation in, in the complete darkness and in light? All of us, we can perform in a very varying uh, environment of light. We can see large object in very incomplete darkness, and we can have a visual perception in bright light. If you go out on a ski slope during a blue sky, sunshine, and you forgot your goggles, it's bright. And the difference in, in, um, in lighting, in, in intensity, between a, a bright ski slope on a bright sunny day and complete darkness that we can perform is about 10 to the 12 uh, factor. So it's like between one photon of light and 10 to the 12. It's a very, very large uh, dynamic range. You don't get any instrument, man-made instrument, that can perform vision under these conditions. So we talk about dark adapters. How, how can we do it? And the idea is that we have different mechanisms. What we need to do in the dark adapted state, we have we, have, we need very high sensitivity, so can we take even one photon of light? We don't care about resolution. We are not going to read in dark, in complete dark, dark adapted state. We don't need to recognize face. It's complete darkness. We walk in darkness. We, walk, we don't want to bump into a tree or to bump into, or to fall into a ditch. Um, and it's achromatic. We don't care about colors. We give up almost all the good features of light in order to get high sensitivity. And this is performed by a, a special type of photoreceptors, which are called rods. In the light adapted condition, we don't care about sensitivity. There is a lot of light. But we do want high resolution. We want to be able to recognize face, to be able to read, to be able to uh, recognize patterns. And we want color vision, because color vision has, in addition to the, to the beauty of it, it gives us a lot of uh, information about the visual scene. And this is controlled by the cone photoreceptors. So we, when we start to begin with, we have two different types of photoreceptors, or two different types of visual system. We have a rod system, which is for darkness, and we have cone system for light. But still, even the cone system, they can perform in a very wide range of illumination. How do they do it? How do they change the ability to adjust themselves? And there are several uh, things which are well known. This is my work from the early 70s or the late 70s. All right, so we, I can stick a microelectrode inside the photoreceptor and then shine light and I see a potential because the idea, the photoreceptors have to transform light into electrical activity. So these are the potentials. So you can have a dim light, dim stimulus. This is in the dark adapted state. You have dim stimulus, small potential, bigger, bigger, and bigger. And then we put a background light. So you, when you put a background light, there is a change, and then the, the stability. And here you see decrements of light, because when we sit here in the, in the lighted room, there are objects which are dimmer than the average illumination, like the brown table. There are objects which are brighter, like the white walls. So we, there are, we are operating in a dimmer environment, in an environment which we have uh, increment and decrements of light. So we can record the potentials, and then we can draw them. And this is what the cone, this is a single cone, this is the photoreceptors. You can see this is the dynamic range in the dark adapted, dim background, brighter background, more bright, more bright. So our cones themselves, the photoreceptors, they can adapt. They do what we call receptor adaptation. They can change their dynamic range according to the illumination around us. So if you look at the illumination around us, it doesn't change much. The difference between the, the brown table and the white wall is not so much. It's about a factor of 5,000, 6,000, not more. So this is, this is the range. This is the dynamic range in each condition. And the photoreceptor can move the dynamic range. And this is done under calcium control. So we call this receptor adaptation. However, if we go to the next step, the horizontal cell, we also get changes in 
the dynamic range, but you can notice if you compare these to this, the curves are here the curves are parallel to each other, they move parallel. Here they are not. And they are not, and, and the distance between two curves is this is a small distance, larger, larger, and larger. So there's something changing in between the cone and the horizontal cell. The cone talks to the horizontal cell. So what changes there? So what is there, we call it synaptic adaptation or reorganization of the visual pathways. So we believe that within the retina, we have special chemical that will not just, like calcium, work within the photoreceptor, but will change the network. They will change the way that cells talk to each other in order to make the performance better in, in each condition of adaptation. And this is basically the, the topic of my talk. How those networks are changing. How these cells talk to each other in a different manner. What are the chemicals? What do they do? Now this is what I said is a system neurobiology because we talk about several cells talking to each other. We are not going to, to the molecular level. What is exactly the mechanism? How will one chemical affect the mechanism? We are talking about how they talk to each other. How they make, okay. Okay, this we can see. <coughs> right, so there are several candidates for what we call neuromodulator. These are, these are chemical released by cells in the retina. And the question is, are, first of all, what are these chemicals doing? Are they really uh, like adaptive neuromodulator, changing the mechanisms of work of the retina under different conditions of light adaptation? And we have dopamine, which was the oldest one that was studied for many years, from the early 90s. Then we have nitric oxide, which was studied in, in about the last 10 years or 12 years. Recently, we talked about retinoic acid, I'll talk about it, and then zinc ion, which I'm not going to touch. And the question is, A, are there really light adaptive mechanisms? B, do they do it? And C, why do we need four or three? Do they have different roles? Do, are they synergistic? Are they additive? Are each one of them operating on different conditions? Or are each one of them operating in different... Uh, hi. Uh, each one of them is operating on a different uh, set, set of conditions. So I will talk about today a little bit nitric oxide and retinoic acid and how they interact with each other if I have time. Um, so just for nitric oxide, it's a very simple. Nitric oxide was, uh, became very popular in the last 10 or 12 years. Um, it's a uh, volatile, it's a, it's a volatile, chem not volatile, it's a gaseous chemical really, uh, very potent, serves as a neurotransmitter. We know nitric oxide is responsible for uh, blood vessel relaxation and responsible for many uh, roles in the GI system and also in the, in the brain and the retina. So the idea is we take L-arginine, which is one in amino acid, under the enzyme nitric oxide synthase, and it produces nitric oxide and citrulline. Nitric oxide can move anywhere within the system. It will activate an enzyme vanilla cyclase, produce cyclic GMP, and cyclic GMP can do relaxation of smooth muscle, closing channel, opening channel. This is how nitric oxide works. And what we do in this type of study, we take a, f a whole retina, and I'll show you in a minute how, and we can do different things. We can add sodium nitroprosite, which is a drug that is an odonor. So we want to know, is this process affected by NO? So we bring NO from outside. We can put L-arginine to see how the endogenous system, how the retina itself, when it gets more uh, substrate, will it produce more nitric oxide? What will it do? And then we can also use L-name, which is a competitive inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, so we can reduce. So what we do, we, we apply nitric NO from the outside, or we fool around or we change the NO from the inside by uh, controlling uh, the substrate or uh, inhibition of, its, of NO production. Uh, if we look at the turtle retina, my special uh, love is uh, turtle retina. Uh, and I try to see, to see other nitric oxide uh, sources in the retina. 
And so we extend the retina for nitric oxide synthase for this enzyme. And yes, oops, sorry. Um, there are, these are immunostaining, and you see amacrine cells, one of the cells of the retina, which stain from nitric oxide synthase. And here we have staining of isolated photoreceptor and mural cells, and retinal cells, which are stained from NADPH diaphragm, which is another uh, indication from nitric oxide synthase. So, the, as I said, my special animal that we work on is a turtle. These are Morevis caspica turtle, which are abundant in Israel. Here in the United States, I worked with Eduardo on the, uh, on the, slide, uh, the radio slider or the pseudomy script elegance. Uh, these are very similar. So these are the turtle, the eye. Then we take the eye out, we cut it into half, and eventually we, we evert the eye on a special dome. And we, have, uh, we can apply different solutions. We have, uh, can apply different uh, um, light stimuli. And we can put microelectrodes into the cells to record photoresponses. These are photoresponses of horizontal cells. We can uh, re uh, look at photoresponses from uh, cones. Or we can even record the entire uh, electrokinogram, which is the response of the retina, the entire retina. And we can learn about the retinal situation. All right, so let's start with uh, some work that we did about five or six years ago. Um, here we record from photoreceptors and horizontal cells, and especially in a turtle, some, some people ask me why, why do you work on turtle? Um, there are several reasons. One, you don't get attached to them. Uh, second, they're very, very cheap. Third, they have a very robust retina. I mean, there's a joke that if you, if you drop the retina preparation on the floor, if you don't step on it, it will still work. Uh, and third, it has the potential of color vision better than human because it, have, it has at least four different types of cones, four different uh, uh, visual pigments. So you, you can have a tetra uh, chromatic uh, vision or trichromatic like us, and uh, they have other types of cones. So it, it has a very com complex retina. And as, as a matter of fact, the retina is if you put, quote, smarter than our retina. Because many of the retina processing information, primates and us, I mean, we move them into the brain, like uh, direction selectivity and stuff like this, while it's in the turtle and frog and fish that are still in the retina. So you can learn a lot about information processing. Uh, so this is a long, long wavelength cone. And this is L1 horizontal cell. I especially show them because they talk to each other. This long wavelength cone had the direct input to the horizontal cell, so we can compare them. We can put the input to the output. And as I said, since I like system neurobiology, we do input output amplification, and we we'll see how it goes. All right. So if we if we if we record from the photoreceptor, which is the first cell in the system, uh, there is. The normal response under control condition is here. If I put, if I add nitric oxide from the outside, the response increases. And you can see this is the control dynamic range. If I add nitric oxide, the response increases. If I wash it back, it, co it comes. So it's a very reversible uh, uh, phenomenon. And I get exactly the same if I add alginate. So yes, there is nitric oxide system in the retina. That was the first thing to say. Is there a nitric oxide system in the retina? Does it affect the cones? And yes, if I add l arginine, I get exactly the same. The control increases and then come back. And if I add l I got exactly the opposite. This is the control under control condition. I take away the nitric oxide. So I get a small response, and then I wash it away. I get it uh, back into normal. So yes, there is nitric oxide. So there was, that was the first. A clue that we need to do to know. And then when we look at the horizontal cell, this is the output cell, the cell that receives input. The horizontal cell does not see light. The cone see light. The cone then talk to horizontal cell. And you get exactly the same phenomenon. Nitric oxide from outside increases, L arginine increases, L name decreases. So we see exactly the same phenomena. And if we can do this in the light adapted and dark adapted condition, and I'm not going to go into details because it's about the same phenomena. The question was, does the, because I'm interested in synaptic transmission, because I'm interested in system neurobiology, we asked, are the, L, are the horizontal cells just follow the photoreceptor? 
because the photoreceptor is affected by nitric oxide, if you change nitric oxide, the photoreceptor change, then you just talk to the horizontal cell, which can change in the same manner. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that nitric oxide, in addition to affecting the photoreceptor, can affect the, the horizontal cell. So then it will change the, the synaptic transfer. So we wanted to, to test signal transmission between those cone photoreceptors and horizontal cells. How do you do it? The best way possible that I cannot do, if I ask Eduardo, he can do it, he has good hands, is to record simultaneously from two cells, one cone and one horizontal cell, and then you do light and you can compare exactly how they do it. It's, it's not that easy. So what we do, we record from about 20 uh, cone photoreceptors and then 20 horizontal cells, and we assume this is, we can do an average function, and now we can compare the average function and do the proper uh, con uh, normalization in order to be able to compare it. And here, this, this is what we got. So I'll go a bit slower. On the left side, this is a transfer function, which means on the left, it's a normalized response of the output cell, and on the abscissa is the normal response of the input cell. So this is the cone response, and this is the horizontal cell. They are normalized because their amplitude is different. So I cannot just compare millivolt to millivolt. On the right, this is more an amplification function. This is a gain, because in the visual system, one of the most important part is gain. The more you go uh, toward the, the brain, there is a, a gain or amplification of the signal, and that's why we can respond to one photon in complete darkness. So this is like a millivolt in horizontal cell divided by millivolt per millivolt of cone as a function of the input of the cone. And you can see that in the dark adapted state, this is the function. It's a nonlinear function in a dark adapted state. So this, the bigger, for small responses, or we look here, for small responses of, of the photoreceptor, you get a large amplification, about five to six times. And when you go bigger and bigger photoresponse, you get a, a small amplification. It makes sense, because in the dark, what we want to see is the dimmest light. We want to recognize very dim objects. So we need high amplification. When you do high amplification, you saturate the large, the large responses. So this makes sense. So it's a nonlinear transfer function with a very high amplification for small signals and lower for large signals. Now, if I put nitric oxide from the outside or L-arginine increasing nitric oxide, we get a linear function. So nitric, adding nitric oxide will linearize the transfer function. And when this is linear, you see this is the amplification function. So you have pretty much constant amplification around the entire range, and it's about, let's say, amplification of two. If I take away nitric oxide by L name, you can see I increase the nonlinearity in the dark, and you can see I have more amplification for small signal compared to large signal. So it seems to me, at least at this point, that nitric oxide will make uh, nitric oxide oppose what we need in the darkness. When we don't have nitric oxide, we have very high amplification and nonlinear function. When we have a lot of nitric oxide, it's a linear function with low and, uh, amplification. So we went to the light adapted state and we did exactly the same. Oh, by the way, this is dopamine. I said before, we have several potential light adaptive uh, neuromodulators. No, dopamine is one of them. And, and one of the questions is, who does what? Dopamine doesn't do it. With dopamine in or out, at least in the turtle, the transfer function remains the same. OK, so then we go to the light adapted state. All right? So now we put a very bright light background. And again, we record from about 10 or 20 photoreceptors and about 20 horizontal cells, and we compare them under the same background condition. And now the control is a linear function. We lost the nonlinearity that was in the dark adapted state. In the, in the light adapted, it's a linear function, and the amplification is constant, a factor of about five. When I put now sodium NO from outside or l in, it didn't change the transfer function, it didn't change the amplification. So there is no much sense of adding more NO in the light adapted state. If I put nitric L name, which eliminate nitric oxide, I, go, I went back to a nonlinear function 
with a high amplification for small signal and a low for large signal. So what this seems to us is that nitric oxide is probably uh, synthesized in the retina under light adapted condition because in the light adapted condition you get exactly the same function as we had before for dark adapted with low, large NO and when you take away the nitric oxide you get back the dark adapted transfer function. Okay. So then just to be sure we, if you remember one of the things that the nitric oxide did it's increasing the response of the photoreceptor to, uh, uh, to, to light stimuli. And we measure here the, the increase or the percentage, inc not percentage, but the ratio, increase in the response by nitric oxide. And this is as a function of different backgrounds. This is dim background, medium, and bright, very bright backgrounds. The, written here in, in, a, in a some a normalized term, but that doesn't matter. What you can see that the effect of nitric oxide, either from outside or from inside, is getting smaller and smaller the brighter the light. The effect of N name is kind of more variable, but at least there is a trend to become larger. And this makes sense if we assume that nitric oxide, that A, there is nitric oxide system in the retina, B, nitric oxide is synthesized in background illumination as a function of intensity and see what the nitric oxide does, at least in the model system of photoreceptors to horizontal cell, it will linearize the transfer function, change amplification, and make the system move from a high sensitivity to low signal into a linear system. Because in the light, we don't want saturation. We don't care about dimmer or brighter. We want high a dynamic range and in a linear or large dynamic range. So a linear dynamic range would be better. Okay. Um, we also, we can record the sensitivity to light. I'm not going to, uh, this is very dim light because when we define threshold, we say, what is the minimum light I need to see? So again, the same as before, this is the control. This is with L name is getting smaller, with uh, L arginine is getting larger. And really the message here is giving this slide. This slide shows, and what every one of us know, is that this synthesization effect of background. When we increase the background, we need more light in order to see. All right? So this curve, this is the normal control curve of, of horizontal cells in the turtle retina. The more, the brighter the background, you need, this is a sensitivity, never mind the unit, you need more and more light in order to see, and this is the normal conditions. The conditions where nitric oxide is synthesized under light. Now if I add to the same system L name, which will stop nitric oxide synthesis, you see this will be the curve. So the ability of the, of the horizontal cell to perform under light adapted condition is compromised. So yes, we think that nitric oxide is one of those uh, light adaptive modulator that are important to set up the behavior of post receptual cells in order to make them behave under light adapted condition. What are the, what is, Josh? What is my timing? Okay, good. All right, I, I want to jump to the next one, which is retinoic acid, because I want to show you afterwards how the two of them work together. So retinoic acid is also, we know it's, it's, it's synthesized in the dark, in the, under light, because uh, the visual cycle in the photoreceptor, we have a pigment which is called rhodopsin. This is the visual pigment. And so when there is light coming, rhodopsin will absorb light and will um, uh, dissociate into two components. One is the opsin, the, the protein, and one is what we call old trans retinaldehyde or retinal, which is the chromophore, the one that is responsible for absorbing light. And this retinaldehyde can have two fates. It can move from the photoreceptor to the pigment epithelium, come back as 11 cis retinaldehyde to make rhodopsin again, or it can shuttle back also to the pigment epithelium and under certain conditions become all trans retinoic acid. So this is the two pot potential fates of a bleaching of 11 cis retinal after rhodopsin absorbed light. 
And of course, uh, and what we are interested in right now is all trans retinoic acid because we know that there is an increase in all trans retinoic acid and it's from the pigment epithelium. The pigment epithelium is the source. So the more background, the, highest, uh, the higher the concentration of all trans retinoic acid. Uh, we perform similar type of experiment, which I'm not going to go too much into them. But again, this is the control. This is, this is the dark adapted cone. This is under control condition, under addition of all trans retinoic acid, and retinoic acid will decrease the photoresponse. But if we look at, um, at sensitivity data, it doesn't change. So retinoic acid doesn't just make the photoreceptor less responsive, it, will, it, it is selective. It hardly affects the small responses, affect much more the large responses. And this is very important because when we go to the horizontal cells, it's even much more extreme. Again, horizontal cells, this is the control condition. Under retinoic acid in the dark, it's getting much smaller. But if I measure small amplitude responses, this is almost doubling of the, of the photoresponses, which means sensitivity is increasing. So despite the fact that the response is getting smaller, sensitivity can be larger. So we want to see what is the transfer function again. And here, what we talk about in the dark adapted state, this is the control, the nonlinear transfer function. Or you can see the synaptic gain. So there is high gain for small responses and getting low and low gain for large responses. When you add uh, uh, all trans retinoic acid, and you look at the, at the transfer function, it's become a little bit more nonlinear. Okay, unlike nitric oxide, which made it linear. And you can see that the gain for small amplitude photoresponses is much larger. So retinoic acid does change the system again, the cone to photo to horizontal cell system, but in a different manner than nitric oxide. And we wanted to further look at it, and we we do that a uh, light adaptation, and this is one of the ways that we measure the ability to adapt. You see, this is the dark potential, this is a photoresponse, photoresponse. When you turn on light, okay, this is, when we turn on a background light, you have a response that will recover to a steady state level, and we can measure the peak of the response and the steady state level. And it turns out that the Foucault photoreceptor, the more, the more recovery, the better the adaptation. The, the, photo, the cell can respond better. So what we do, we measure the, the ratio between, well, it's the reverse. It's V steady state to V peak is a sort, sort of a measure of background adaptation. And if we look here, you can see these are photoreceptors. These are backgrounds. This is the VSS of a V peak. And the more, the brighter the light, you can see the ratio is coming from 0.62 to 0.4. But it doesn't matter if you have control condition or retinoic acid, and the same is horizontal cell. So there is no big uh, message here. Uh, when we go, we do the effect of retinoic acid as a function of background. You can see there is these are cones, these are horizontal cell. Again, there is a big effect in the dark adapted state, and the more the brighter the background, the effect is getting smaller. Exactly what we think that the retinoic acid is made in the dark adapted state. Uh, when we look at the amplification, you can see this is high amplification, and the more, the stronger the background the amplification is smaller. So again, we just, these are like uh, functional criteria showing, yes, retinoic acid is produced more and more under background light. Therefore, when you add retinoic acid, it will not change much, all right? Um, we looked at the transfer function in the light adapted state. Again, the normal control, as we showed before, is linear. When we added a retinoic acid, it didn't change much. It does change the, um, uh, the amplification. Um, I will not, I think I talked too much. I just want to go to my summary somewhere. Yeah. Um, so what we think right now is that both nitric oxide and retinoic acid are acting at a photoreceptor horizontal cell level, but they are doing different things. 
Nitric oxide will help linearizing the transfer function. So when you move from the dark adapted state to the light adapted state, the transfer between photoreceptors and horizontal cell, and again, this is a modern system, is becoming from a nonlinear transfer function to a linear one. The retinoic acid will set the amplification. So the nitric oxide will linearize the, the transfer function, but keep amplification in a relatively low rate, <coughs> about a, fa a factor of two. When you have retinoic acid, it will raise the amplification factor from two to around five and six, and that's why you can still have high amplification even when you have a linear transfer function in the light adapted state. And finally, I just want to thank my students. Um, the nitric oxide work was done by Dr. Hannah Levy and Gilad Twig. Um, Elite Weiner is an MDPhD student who is just finishing now, and she did the retinoic acid. Elena Segal is doing the zinc that I, she has not finished yet, so I cannot talk about the zinc yet. We don't have the data. But it turns out that the zinc is probably a dark adapted signal. It helps the dark adapted to have high amplification. And Rim Taha is a new MDPhD student, and she's working on what is the difference between, I mean, these students work on the distal retina, the photoreceptor, horizontal cell. She's working on ganglion cell because we want to know eventually what the retina tells the brain. And that will be her, that's her project. Thank you very much. so that they could uh, study the effect of nitric oxide on the retinal system. <laughs> Barry Knox is professor of biochemistry and ophthalmology. Um, I talked a little bit about personal relationships when I was talking about Bob, and Barry is a prime example of how personal relationships lead to advances in science. Barry was a spearheaded to work uh, using transgenic frogs uh, to study different systems. Uh, as a result of that, Andrea Vixian and Mike Zuber came to spend a year with Barry in the lab, and they are now permanent residents in Syracuse. Um, sitting in front of Barry is Ed Pugh, who had been a long-term collaborator with Bob, Eduardo, and, and Barry, and as a result of our relationship with Ed, we have Peter Calvert. Uh, these uh, are ongoing relationships that affect the tenor of an entire organization. Barry has had 18 years of continuous funding from the National Eye Institute. He just returned from study section. Uh, Barry has a large growing family, a large laboratory, and I have absolutely no idea how he does it. Um, Barry has stepped into the leadership position. Um, in Bob's absence, uh, it was he and Bob that were largely responsible for the growth of uh, our center to now number over 50 people. It's my pleasure to introduce Barry Knox, who will talk about live cell imaging and photoreceptors. So, 
first, I wanted to thank uh, Steve for inviting me and giving this uh, opportunity. I'm honored to be here. And I'd also like to thank you for organizing the symposium in honor of Bob. Um, you know, Bob was a great friend to all of us. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was when we did science with Bob, it was, it was a lot of fun uh, all the time. We had fun. So when we organized a, a, a scientific meeting, it would be hard to summarize his contributions because when I helped organize the meeting in April to uh, honor him at the annual research and vision conference in Fort Lauderdale, uh, there, there were standing room only and I had to turn away people who kept contacting me to see if they could speak. And, and it was an amazing seminar that went all afternoon and, and I, I didn't tell anybody to stop and stay on time because it was so much fun. Um, today's talk, uh, is actually is, is a result of my interactions with Bob in one of those ways that you don't expect. I left Karana's lab and I worked on Redoption, but I had put that all behind me. And then, like in the Al Pacino movie, where just when you're out, he pulled me back in. <laughs> so Bob did that too. He got me started to work back on Redoption, and, and that was also when um, I met Eduardo Celestia, who's going to talk after the break. And he. Um, and he and I started working on Redopsin, and that led to the, the current work now. And so we, while we chased projects that were um, not directly related to today's talk, Bob and I started on Redopsin a long, what seems like a long time ago. So I don't really need to introduce the visual system because Dr. Cohen did such a great job. My uh, point here in, in, in showing these pictures from Mary Pearson and Trevor and Ed uh, are to sort of Try to focus your attention on this particular uh, segment in the, in the photoreceptors of the rods, which is what we're going to talk about today. This is called the outer segment. And, and this is a frog retina here, a piece of a frog retina. And this is a primate retina over on this side. And both, um, both retinas, in fact, all the vertebrates have these uh, structures here that is where the light transduction comes about. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that's fascinating um, to, to a lot of us in vision is the this, this structure here and what it does and how to build it and how to maintain it. And this has turned out to be a very important, um, a lot of uh, important genes in this particular process in, in human health because mutations in many of these actually lead to one form or another retinal disease. And that's going to be the topic that I'd like to talk to you about in, in the next, say, 20 minutes or so, is one of our experiments that have to do with this. But there's also another aspect of this, uh, which uh, Dr. Perlman also mentioned, which is the visual cycle. And that is carried out in coordination with the surrounding tissue called the retinal pigment epithelium. And this is the second point of, of real interest in, in uh, diseases, because this retinal pigment epithelium, one of its jobs is to uh, to maintain the retinoids and to take care of the retinoids that uh, are required for vision. And, and so these two rather unique kind of processes seem to right now have a lot of attention in the vision community for, uh, for looking at disease processes and, and treatments. So um, I'm going to talk about the rods today, and in particular my uh, one of my first uh, scientific loves is this protein rhodopsin. And this is a protein which has a component that is uh, made of protein that spans the bilayer membrane uh, seven times. And it also has a cofactor uh, that's derived from vitamin A that is the uh, light absorbing component in this molecule. And I don't want to go through all the details of this beautiful picture from uh, Ed's paper. But this light activates the protein. And when this protein uh, is activated, then it carries out a cascade of, it initiates a cascade of reactions, which end up changing the membrane potential and signaling to the, the next order cells. And, and this process is conserved in both rods and cones, but we know most about what's going on in the rods. And um, that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So. Um, the, the disease that is of interest to, to, to me today is to talk about is retinitis pigmentosa. And this is a de slow degen mostly slow degenerative disease of the retina in which uh, 
the, the rod cells, often photoreceptor cells, start to die. And there's pictures of, uh, I don't have time to go through it, pictures of various stages in the retina of a fundus image of patients from a, pa a really beautiful paper by Hamill a few years ago. And the, the points of the, the disease that I wanted to talk about, which are sort of puzzling, are the fact that the age of onset is highly variable depending upon the particular cause of the disease. But it can also initiate very late in life in which you start to have loss of photoreceptors, maybe even into your 50s. And, and, and that slow process is a bit of a puzzle because many of the diseases, uh, our origins are in single gene mutations that are um, there from birth and expressed from birth. So that's one of the puzzles, I think, that we haven't really come to grips with is why it's so slow. Um, and another feature of retinitis pigmentosa, which is, off, is kind of odd, is that the autosomal dominant forms are usually the mi mildest of the group. And I think that might give us some hint as to the function that's being uh, affected in the, in the rods. And um, at, by uh, 2006, I think the number is up a little bit higher, there's about 45 or so different types of genes or loci that have been identified. So this is not one type of disease. Um, mutation, but it's many of them. There's many of them. And all only thing that you can really say about this besides the, the fact that they all seem to have this common kind of endpoint is that most of the gene products are expressed in, in rods or cones. It's many of them are exclusively expressed in these cells. And that leads you to think that perhaps the process that's affected by these mutations may be involved in in the specialized compartments of the rod cell, phototransduction, or in the support of this whole process. So that's kind of leading to some of the thinking that you see um, many of us have in this field. But it's hard to get a clue in the overall um, disease from looking at any individual uh, particular process because when you look at in detail what these gene products actually do, I didn't want you to read this, but you'll see that you find um, genes that affect all sorts of processes in, um, in the outer segment, in the supporting tissue, the metabolism, cytoskeleton, trafficking. So there is some uh, other process that, that it makes these cells particularly sensitive to mutation that leads to their demise. And so it's hard to study this as a general class, and so many of us have focused on um, and this is not something that we do alone. It's been a big effort to study this since the early 90s, um, to study rhodopsin mutations and to look at how those mutations affect the cell. And that's what I'm going to show you some of our unpublished results on uh, this morning. So to, to, to sort of make this intelligible, I wanted to, to give you a nice uh, sort of general overview of the cells that we're going to be talking about and the proteins and then talk a little bit more about their, the mutations that cause disease before we get into some data. So this is a, a, a picture that we took from a nice review by Paul Hargrave in the 90s who uh, sequenced protein uh, redox in the old-fashioned way by amino acids before there were high sensitivity methods. And this cell has a, a number of specialized compartments. I've already talked about the outer segment. And the outer segment is filled with stacks of um, bilayer discs, which are um, also filled with this membrane protein called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is up to 90% of the protein in the outer segment here. And the protein, like all cells, is, uh, tra is translated in the uh, inner segment here of this particular cell. And since it's a membrane protein, it has to be transported to uh, the outer segment by uh, specialized process, which actually hasn't really been worked out um, in, in molecular detail yet, although there's a lot of data on this process. There's a connecting cilium which uh, connects the inner and outer segment. And um, so then there's the mitochondria, which are you'll see in some pictures, are, are which support this energetic process of phototransduction stacked up right underneath the uh, outer segment and the inner segment. Um, just to give you a little sense, I'll show you some of our own data there, but there's an enormous amount of rhodopsin out here, and, 
estimates in frog, for example, in our frogs, there's three to four millimolar protein in this part of the cell. So if you think about it, that's, there's an enormous load on the cell to make, oops, let's see, I gotta go forward. There's an enormous load on the cell to make this protein. Now, one more thing I, I'd like to explain is that uh, this, this uh, outer segment is uh, continually renewed over, uh, over time. These are neurons, so they don't divide, but um, the outer segment cells, which this was discovered in the 60s, is, um, is actually renewed, so that new protein is made in the inner segment, is transferred to the base of the outer segment, and inserted there in a process that we don't really understand very well at all. And then over time, these um, membranes at the base of this disc, of the outer segment, are pushed up by the new ones coming in. So you have sort of a stack being built up from the bottom of new membrane protein. And every day this happens. And at the end, these, these outer segments get to a certain length, and we don't know what controls that length, but at some point there's signals that the, uh, the oldest dip, tip part of the cell is shed, and the surrounding pigment epithelium, which I mentioned before, um, phagocytose these. So there's a really interesting pro aspect to this cell that um, we actually will exploit, is there's a time factor here in these cells. Newly synthesized membrane proteins are found here at the base, and older proteins are found at the tip. And it depends on the species. This happens in all species that have been looked at. And uh, depending on the species, this can be anywhere from uh, two to six weeks, depending on the species. And, in the animal that I'm, I'm going to show you, the frog, uh, this is about five or five weeks or so. It depends on the temperature for these uh, guys. So that's a long time. More than a month of record is in this uh, outer segment. There's no evidence that anything comes back out of the outer segment. So that once the protein's up there, it stayed up there. And there's also no evidence that there's degradation or any sort of protein machinery to get rid of the proteins out there either. So that if you consider it, the cell makes these photosensitive membranes, puts them out there for light detection, and then forgets about them and, and focuses on the next day's job. So um, now back to RP, now that we understand a little bit. Now, over, more, over 100 mutations in rhodopsin have been identified and been linked to autosomal dominant RP. And they're found sort of throughout the protein sequence. And here's the, uh, this would be the face of the protein that is actually involved in signaling the molecules that I showed you about. And this is the part of the protein that's inside those disks that has some uh, rather undefined character so far as to what, if there is a function inside the disk membranes. Uh, as you can see, you know, all these different colors are scattered throughout, and they've been classified by various ways as to severity and, and the kind of protein defects that are found, and I won't, I won't go through the summary of it. But there's a lot of different types and classifications, and, and they all end up killing the rod cells somehow. The most, um, and rhodopsin actually is uh, the, the most common form of autosomal dominant RP in the United States. There's a particular mutation, which is the one that we focused on, which is a proline histidine change over here in the N terminus that is responsible for the uh, majority of the rhodopsin related RP. And it's in fact estimated, at least in the United States, to be responsible for 10% of the RP. And the RP is a fairly common disease, so uh, this is a significant problem. This was the first uh, mutation identified by Elliot Burson and Ted Dreja in 90. And a lot of work has been done on this particular uh, protein, and I won't have time to show you much of that, but I wanted to just summarize the, the, the key features of the, the mutation and how it affects the protein. So there are folding defects. The protein doesn't fold perfectly. There's something off with the way it folds. And, um, but it's not a totally unfolded protein, and, and that's actually a hard concept when you start to think about membrane proteins anyway. So there are folding problems. We can detect this biochemically. We can detect this in cells. And um, that's been studied quite a bit. But the protein can bind retinol, and it can carry out some of the functions that it, it needs to. So it's a 
partially defective protein, but not completely defective. It's also not as stable even when it folds properly, so there's a defect there. And in the experiments that have been looked at in, in cell culture, the uh, cell accumulates in the endoplasmic reticulum in cell culture systems and seems to have some misbehavior in cells. And um, it's stabilized by its chromophore. I don't have time to really talk much about that today, but we're, we're actively looking at that. So this actually allows me to bring up one of the problems dealing with uh, the pr proteins that are expressed in photoreceptors is that there's not an easy system to culture rod cells. And like most neurons, they don't divide. It's hard to keep them alive in culture for very long, and it's hard to manipulate them with all our favorite you know, genetic tools, molecular biology tools. And so a lot of what has been done in the, um, in the, in the Rhodopsin Pro23 HIST model have been done in cell cultures. And, and I think I tried to illustrate before that the rod cell is specialized to handle a lot of membrane traffic. And this uh, led to, the con to, to uh, an idea that maybe we should look in a rod cell to see how this protein behaves. So um, people had made transgenic mice um, with this uh, gene knocked into it, and the retinas pretty much rapidly die away. Um, and that's perhaps if you're writing a grant and you want to be positive, that mimics the human disease. On the other hand, it's very quick. In a few months, your, the retina is basically destroyed. In a human, P23H uh, humans, uh, patients, they have uh, functional rods into their middle age, if not longer. So it's not an identical model. So, um, but we didn't really have any information about um, how to, you know, what was wrong with the protein in a rod cell. And so we started this saga with Eduardo and other people a long time ago, and, and we decided to use transgenic frogs, which was what I was doing for other reasons, which I'm not going to talk about. We're, we're still interested in that. But we took advantage of this system for making very rapid, quick transgenics. Um, in a, in, a, in a, a matter of a few days, we can have transgenic animals. The eyes form within a week. We have functional rods that we can look at, and it's very cheap, so that's important. And we use um, this model a lot for many things. And so we decided to examine, and all, I forgot to mention that the rods in the frog cell are very large. So that's very great if you want to do sort of high resolution microscopy. So for all these reasons that we decided to take a look at the, the rod cells, and I'm going to give you a couple of different examples. This experiment started with, um, in collaboration with Ed, who's luckily here today, visiting this week. To, to show you that um, one of the things that we really wanted to do was sort of try to look in live cells um, to see if we could see what's going on at high resolution without fixations, and also with the hope that maybe down the road we could actually watch things happen in time. So, um, and so that was one of the motivation factors. And then the other thing was that uh, in live cells without the fixations and using antibodies, there's a hope that we would be able to do some quantitative um, analysis of the localization and behavior of the protein. And that's really difficult when you fix and have to use antibodies or other things. And I think that's been a, a problem in the, in the field. So Ed and, and Peter and, and some of their people and, and some of us, we got together and, and, and worked on uh, live cell imaging. And here's a picture that uh, my graduate student, Mohammed, who most of the work I'm showing you from my lab today is done by Mohammed, um, on a, a live retinal chip. Um, that has been uh, transgenic and has been made to express the protein EGFP. And the, the, the cell, the pieces of the tissue are taken out into culture and then scanned in a confocal. Uh, and then we can then do different things with the uh, image. And in this case, what I, what I can show you is we can look at some very high resolution detail that just is very difficult to get if you're looking at uh, fixed tissue. And for example, you can see this is the inner segment to orient to. This is the very large outer segment. This is about 60 microns, okay, giving you a sense of the width. And the width is maybe five, I mean, I'm sorry, seven microns across at this point here. The inner segment and the synaptic region, even there, you can see some features and details. So, um, 
And what, what, what's really interesting here is there are these support structures called calical processes, which actually help sort of basket the outer segment there. And, and you can easily see the, these structures in, in, in detail. And so this is an example. I won't have time to go through um, the paper that uh, Peter and, and Ed, John Pete, and another number of others did to show you that the G, EGFP is easily quantified in these cells. And uh, this is now, um, this movie is not going to work, unfortunately, but this is a now not, that was a surface rendering to show you the surface aspects of the retina. In this case, um, this is now a uh, 3D reconstruction in which we're looking at the details of the cells. And the brightness of the cell is directly related to the, um, you know, the intensity of the concentration of the protein. And so you can see the mitochondrial region is excluding GFP mostly. There's uh, nuclear regions in the expanded ER segment that you can see readily here. You can see the connecting um, cilium and then the axonine going up where there's more uh, water than in where the membranes are. And so again, I show this just to give you a sort of a, a flavor of the um, type of quantitative analysis that we do. And now I want to bring ourselves to ask in the next few minutes about the, the mutation and how it's affected. So one of the things that you need to do in, when we're doing these kinds of experiments is we need to tag our protein of interest with some visible molecule. And we've used a number of fluorescent proteins. I'm going to show you images of EGFP fused to rhodopsin as a, a fusion protein here and also a mutation which has this. And we've used another fluorescent protein um, which is red fluorescence, it's M-cherry. It's another one of these uh, colorful proteins. And um, what, what we did when we made these transgenic animals, and this is an example rod to see, you could see in this case, I guess I should have shown the, um, the phase image too, or the DIC image, but there's very little protein in the inner segment of this particular cell but there's a lot of rhodopsin that's found in the outer segment. So that's different than the soluble protein, so it's behaving like we expect. It's going to the outer segment. And, um, and that's, that's great. One, what you see, you'll also notice also, is that there are these sort of stripes here um, that go up and down, persistent stripes. And again, this, uh, we, we decided in conversations with Ed a few, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago now, we decided, Mohammed and I decided to track down this particular um, issue. Um, and if you look here, in this case, you can see here's a soluble GFP, which is very nice and homogeneous, filling the water space. The membrane protein reduction is stacked up like you can see here. And the, uh, the stacking structure doesn't seem to match any kind of uh, structure we can see in the EMs or in light microscopes or with any antibody staining. And, and this, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through this. This is one of those things where two years of Muhammad's Muhammad's backbreaking work can be summarized in two bullet points. But <laughs> that's the way it is now. <laughs> so this banding pattern originates, it's a, it's a diurnal variation, a light dark variation in disk assembly in the outer segments. And we see and they, it, this kind of behavior is seen in all sorts of animals, and so it's a general property. And it seems to be a variation in the amount of rhodopsin that's put in in the light versus the dark. And there's a lot of different um, possibilities for what this could be um, caused by could be changes in protein efficient, translation efficiency, trafficking, uh, a different membrane assembly, and we're, we're busy to track it down. But I, I have to show this to you, or I would have skipped it, because when you're going to look at the mutants, you have to be able to understand the, the, the differences between the wild type and the, and the mutant. Okay, so what about um, the outer segment? And what about Pro23 heads? Where, what happens to it? Does it, if we told you it's misfolded, does it go out and form stripes out here in the outer segment? Does it get out here? Is it held up down here? You know, is it degraded away so we can't see it? So there's all these questions now that we wanted to answer. And so the first, uh, first result we got was the following. And this is, uh, I just focus your attention here on this panel. This is an individual cell that Peter took images of expressing pro 23 hiss and um, what, what you can see here is that while the rhodopsin 
It is found only in the outer segment, like it's supposed to be. The mutant is found both in the outer and the inner segment. You can quantify this amount of protein, and you can find that in the Rhodopsin case, the ratio of protein in the outer to inner segment is very high. And in the Rhodopsin uh, mutant case, it's, it's rather low. So this tells you that there's something wrong with the localization of the protein in the rod cell, but it's not completely off. It, it can traffic to the outer segment and, um, and can perhaps function out there somehow. One thing I, I wanted to, to mention in, in this uh, particular experiment is that, the, and I don't have time to talk about it, I'll be happy to answer questions. In the uh, transgenic case, when we make transgenic animals, the fluorescent protein that you're looking at is, is in only a small uh, concentration compared to the endogenous gene. So endogenous gene could be three millimolar. In the case of these trans genes, you can see that they're much less than three millimolar. So, we're looking at tracer amounts of the mutant and asking what is its behavior, okay? So it's not that we're overloading the cell, we're not, we're not causing any changes by just mass action, making extra rhodopsin. So one of the things that you notice right away when you start looking at these pictures that Muhammad generates is that um, not only are they found, uh, rhodopsin, the mutant is found where it shouldn't be inside the, in, Bulge ER containing segment, but you also see these foci of uh, uh, fluorescence, which look like aggregates, not only in here but also out in the uh, out in the outer segment, and that's the that's never uh, been noted before. And um, you can take a look at this uh, really clearly. You can see all of these kinds of protein aggregates out here in this outer part of the cell. This is actually a clever experiment he did in which he made a, a, a frog which makes two types of transgenes, a wild type red protein and a mutant green in the same cell. So we can sort of track as an internal control what's going on in these cells. And, and you can clearly see, even in this light, that this red is not, um, this is the scan, but it's not aggregating or any showing any sort of that punctate aggregation staining that you see in the, the mutant protein. So there seems to be different behaviors even in the same cell. So that's another control thing. It's not the cell that's sick or causing problems. It's an inherent property of the mutant protein. And if you look down, these are like rods. If you look down the edge of the rod, you can sort of get a, a, another look at it. And this is what we're looking at here. And this is the same kind of view where you see a nice even stain throughout here. But in the same section, we do a different color. Sorry. The, uh, you can see here that the punctate aggregation like points here are not coinciding with any a mutant pro uh, wild type protein. Again, the mutant seems to be behaving one way and the wild type is behaving a different way. Um, and this is, seems to be out of focus, but you, good enough. Uh, if, you, if you count where these aggregates happen, you can see that they seem to be formed, you find them more commonly in the outer part of the outer segment than in the inner part of the outer segment when you break it up here. And, and remember, I told you the outer point is where the um, older protein is. And so this leads you to think that perhaps, or leads us to think, and hopefully you, if I'm good at this, that, um, that maybe there's a time-dependent formation of these protein aggregates that happens as the protein forms, and that as it sits out here for a month, maybe there's a time-dependent aggregation. Um, you can use uh, fluorescence photo bleaching um, to, to look and see what kind of characters these uh, fluorescent aggregates have. So, uh, and, and if you look here in this particular case, Muhammad did a, a, a cell which had the nice, beautiful diurnal stripes. And then when he photo bleached this area to destroy the rhodopsin, very rapidly after that photo bleaching here, you can see that the protein in the neighboring areas flowed back in, diffused back in. And, and Peter and, and, and Peter and his students have continued to, to work on, have actually worked elaborately on this diffusion of the 
protein, which I would tell you to look at the JGP article for details. But in this case, what we show is that it's mobile. Okay, that's the important point here. If you look at regions of a mutant protein in which it's not mobile, I mean, in which there's no apparent aggregates or uh, foci of fluorescence, you can see, like in this case here, that in fact it diffuses back into this region in a similar fashion to the, the wild type protein. So when they don't see aggregates, the protein, the mutant protein seems to you know, flow into the bleached area pretty similarly to wild type. However, if you photo bleach the um, aggregated areas, these big intense fluorescents more at the tip, then what you see is that in fact there's very little recovery in these segments. And that suggests that these aggregates are not in communication with the rest of the disk protein and suggest there may be some structural difference out there in, in the uh, outer segment. Um, Mohammed also noticed uh, that there were these foci or aggregate-like properties inside the inner segments, and you can see he's got a couple of these areas right here highlighted. But when you photo bleach those areas and look at the recovery, um, what he saw was that in fact, uh, both of these kind of, uh, in this particular cell, they recover. So this is not normal. You're not normally have rhodopsin in the inner segment, and you shouldn't have a sort of a, co a concentration of mutant rhodopsin. But yet, when you do see it, it hasn't got the same sort of aggregation-like properties that you find in the outer segment. So there's a different character of the inner segment versus the outer segment one. And I think I'm almost done. Um, and I'll just sort of say that, OK, so what? And, and I think this is getting us to, I'm going to speculate wildly here. I mean, I, I think in the, in the spirit of Bob, I think that's great. Because <laughs> uh, he was, that was so much fun about what, what, when, when we worked with him. The speculation part was the best. So Eduardo, when he was trying to do these experiments um, way back in the ancient history, he, he noticed that they were really mechanically fragile, and I won't go into it. We don't have any quantitative. This is anecdotal, as I said, speculation. And Muhammad noticed also that he could see disruptions in what otherwise looked like a normal um, outer segment pattern when you had cells which had these concentrations of protein. Here's some examples just to, to give you a flavor. So, so maybe these aggregations are causing some disruption of the outer segment. And, and what you can do if, if you're fortunate enough to have a pathology department which is very generous and, and, and a, a wonderful uh, a EM person like Joyce, you can actually do some EMs and, and, and get some really interesting data. And this is an example of a, uh, a right outer segment in which you, uh, this is not really looking up that good from where I am, but sorry, I'll try to describe. So you can see in my images and, and certainly in Muhammad's, you can see nice discs here. Even when you're tough on the retina, the discs seem to, you know, pull keep together, but in, in the majority of the animals and the majority of the cells, a lot of times you see these disruptions of the disc outer segment areas um, that you don't see in the wild type at all. So maybe, you know, maybe what's going on here is that the protein, the mutant protein, is, um, is, is aggregating, and this is destabilizing the bilayer structure, the membrane structure, and causing a disruption as the proteins aggregate, and that could explain why it's immobile. And perhaps this renders the, uh, the outer segment more mechanically uh, unstable and, and, and then susceptible to damage by typical kinds of behavior. Um, you know, rubbing your eyes, for example, does put some pressure on the eye. And, you know, that kind of thing could give you, it's a not a very stable structure to begin with, and then perhaps if you start to insult this structure with these insult with these kinds of aggregates, that it could lead to some um, problems in the photoreceptors down the road. Um, is this true? I said I was speculating, so I did. And, and I think what we want to try to do is can we measure this membrane instability directly by uh, you know mechanical methods that we can quantify this, and can we see this at work in um, in other models like mouse models? So um, I'll skip the conclusions because um, I don't really want to go too long, but I think that the, clearly we've had some fun in the spirit of Bob looking at the um, Pro23 his uh, model in the frog. 
And I think we've now gotten on to some kind of ideas about protein aggregation that I think could generalize. I, I think uh, if we think about the rhodopsin model and the P23H model as a, a way of destabilizing the disks, that could fit into RP. But membrane protein aggregations in uh, neurodegenerative diseases is actually a very common theme right now, and it's very hot, like in ALS, and Parkinson's, and uh, other sorts of, I mean, Huntington's. They, these, uh, these proteins tend to aggregate in the membrane, and there's not a really good system to study this um, over these time scales. And so I, I'm, we're thinking, Mohammed and I are thinking that maybe this would be a really good way to look at other sorts of neurodegenerative diseases that have a membrane aggregation component. So uh, again, thanks for your attention. Um, this is the, the star of the show. Mohammed's been doing this work. Shay has worked on this project too. Ming, I didn't get to show you, but this is the frog team. Many is Peter's graduate student. There's Peter thinking about the fusion, I think, along this river here. Um, and, and Ed's got started with the quantitative imaging. And uh, I mentioned uh, Joyce and Dr. Three next third. Thank you very much for your attention. of this work, I, I think there are a couple of different avenues that we could look at. And, and besides the basic science, I think one of the things that we've been thinking about now is, is there a way of um, designing molecules, small molecules, that would prevent the aggregation, that would either prevent it or slow it down, or to stabilize the protein so that it doesn't destabilize membranes. And so I think that would be the you know, the longer term goal would be to try to see, prevent this aggregation in, in rhodopsin, right? So that would be sort of one angle. The second angle of applications is to sort of take this outer segment membrane test tube, which it is, which has us about six weeks of time to look at, and start to look at other neurodegenerative processes, uh, proteins that are linked to this in, in, a, in a way that we could perhaps quantify the, their behavior there. So uh, those are, our, for us, the two immediate applications for that. I mean, we, we need, and with, because retinitis pigmentosa, particularly the ones that we're interested in are so slow, if we can find ways of just changing the kinetics of whatever causes the loss, I think that's a, that would be a real advantage and benefit. Right now, there's no treatments. Jeremy. Thank you. So, so thinking about this in the context of neurodegenerative disease, right, the, the idea of protein aggregation is, is a hugely hot topic, and, and there are, are processes both to stimulate cell death and, and repair, such as autophagy and shock protein activation. Have you looked at whether these aggregates stimulate autophagy, either through shock protein abnormalities, or is there even a progression in your, in your uh, genetic model of more of these aggregates that you get later and later? Uh, that's great. Those are great questions, and, and I don't have the definitive answer. I mean, I think we we have been looking at uh, unfolded protein response, you know, AR stress related problems and, and things related to autophagy. Um, the frog is probably, at least at the moment, is is not showing any strong evidence of that because I think perhaps our levels of expression may not be high enough to trigger that. But I think. You know, we're, gonna, we're working on that now with inducible systems, and, and we should be able to take another stab at it, I hope. But I think those are absolutely where the questions need to be. Yes? I have two questions. Did I understand you to say that the red and the green fluorescent versions of protein do not heterodimerize? We don't think so. We don't see any, con we don't see similar concentrations in the same location. Is that surprising? Yes, a lot. <laughs> um, the other question is, uh, is there turnover of the protein in the most outer segments? 
So uh, the way the outer segments are built, according to our current knowledge, is that uh, once they get to the tip, then there's a process that involves uh, the surrounding epithelial cells to <coughs> shed a, a segment of the membranes that are out there at the very tip. And it's not clear how that happens, but there's a phagocytotic event that goes to take off the, the, a day or so's worth of, of protein at the tip. And that's where it's degraded in another, another cell. There doesn't appear to be machinery in the rod to do that once it's escaped the inner segment. So it's trapped in the outer segment. Steve? Did you say um, in the normal outer segment that this expanding pattern is actually as a result of dark light cycle? That's right. Yes, it is. So if you keep the frogs in the dark, you don't get it. So it's a it's not circadian, but it's diurnal. It's light regulated. And so the length, Muhammad found that the, the message doesn't change in light or dark, at least with a 12 hour, 12 hour, he doesn't see much of any change. But the protein clearly is, concentration is changing out, out there, so. Um, so the second part of that is, are there kinases that are also diurnally regulated and is that serine right next to It's not supposed to. That's, a, that's an interesting point. The, the, that particular part of the protein would be buried inside the endoplasmic reticulum and end up sequestered from the rest of the cytoplasm. So it's not supposed to be phosphorylated. And people have looked at phosphorylation of redox in wild type, and that's not where it's phosphorylated at all. But that's really cool. I think we have to track it down. A really basic question, but it's on my mind as, as kind of very general, is this, that our systems, acid, uh, acidified systems, I think are, have been very highly uh, correlated, at least to me, I mean, that's not, I'm not a scientist, in uh, cancers, and uh, I think in some sense I'm bringing it up to, to uh, how, it, like the global system being acidified and the human body being acidified by like high carbohydrate diets and fruit, fruit juices and stuff. But, but this is a very general question about the way in which problems of homeostasis could maybe generally be better studied in terms of the pH. I mean, that's a very basic, basic thing, but so what I'm saying is if our human human bodies or even frog bodies are compromised by a uh, response to trying to go homeostatic from overly acid systems, then how does that affect the proteins? Does that agglomerate pro proteins? Or does it disrupt normal uh, uh, phagocytic processes? Does it uh, that, that's, a, that's a really great question, and, and I'm, I'm not sure I can really inform much about it. The chair of my department is the one who should be staying here to answer that. She studies pH regulation in, in cells. And in this particular case, we are adding a histidine to the, the mutation is a histidine residue. And it, it may be protonated under the folding conditions we find in the cell. So that, that we don't know why it's misfolded, and so the pH could play a role in the folding, and we haven't really measured the pH of the cells with mutant or without, and I think that's a, that's a, it's a great point to do, to try to see about that, because that's something that could be modified in, in, you know, down the road. So, But I'm the wrong person to be generalizing, so. Thank you. Uh,
Our next speaker is Eduardo Celesio. Eduardo has come full circle. Eduardo was a graduate student uh, at the Institute for Century Research, working with Gus Ingridson. As I mentioned earlier when I discussed Professor Perlman, Eduardo uh, went to the Moran Center in Salt Lake for postdoctoral fellowship, and then returned here to join, rejoin the group eight years ago. Um, Barry alluded to the fact that Bob Barlow would often engage in uh, exercises of looking at different reasons for scientific events happening. He did this with regard to the leading cause of blindness in this country, which is age-related macular degeneration. It's replaced diabetic retinopathy and, and other reasons for this. His speculation uh, about the relationship of metabolic causes for macular degeneration challenged uh, the existing dogma as to why age-related macular degeneration takes place. Um, Bob, along with Eduardo and Yumiko, have worked on a series of experiments to show the relationship between um, metabolic changes and potential relationships to age-related macular degeneration. Uh, Eduardo and Yumiko are continuing the work that Bob had started. Uh, Bob initially uh, had made these observations uh, based on experiments that they were doing regarding blood glucose levels, and this has been translated to a much more broad approach to metabolism. Eduardo is initially going to talk about metabolic changes in the retina. However, <laughs> he is going to be talking about mouse vision. And you will see the relationship because as the model developed for macular degeneration, uh, the mouse has become the system that's been most important for looking at uh, this type of change 
And it's critical to be able to do accurate assessment of visual changes in mouse. And for that, we have to thank Eduardo and Nico. Eduardo, please. Thank you, Dr. Hefner, for the, for the introduction. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of history first. When I first uh, joined the Center for Vision Research, uh, Dr. Barlow was actually in the transition between uh, his work using the portrait craft and starting his work on the, studying the, the effects of metabolism on mouse vision. So at that time, it became pretty evident that it was not just enough to study the, the, the retina, to, to look at the structure of the retina, count the number of cells, uh, look at the using you know, histochemistry, measure um, protein levels, but it was also pretty obvious that we also needed some kind of assay where we could test and determine whether the animal could see or not. That is, if there was a loss, let's say, of 10% or 50% of photoreceptors, how would that impact or influence the visual um, behavior of the animal in, 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 in its environment? So together with Yumiko and Dr. Barlow, we uh, started to uh, uh, study this, uh, the, the, the visual uh, sensitivity of mice using an assay uh, which looks at the automoral response. So the topic of my talk today, now that that project continued to grow and it became actually a, a pretty uh, substantial effort. So what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about that project and then two new projects that we have going that uh, really uh, build upon some of the initial findings. So the first, the first uh, topic, uh, oops, get to this. So in, in the first place, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contributions of rods and cones to mouse, to mouse vision and then uh, I'll talk about the two new projects. One is looking at, uh, at looking at visual sensitivity in the mouse model of radiopsia, which is a rare condition um, in which uh, subjects actually have a difficult time detecting fast-moving objects. And then I'll talk about some new findings we are looking at visual deficits in a, in a mouse model of diabetes. However, before we start, I'd like to, uh, as part of the introduction, just sort of describe the optimal response in mice, and uh, although Ido and uh, Dr. Uh, Knox have already described uh, the anatomy of the uh, of the retina, I'd like to just present a few slides in, in reference to the function of rods and cones. <laughs> so, to measure uh, visual sensitivity in mice, we use the optimal response. This is this is the setup. It is commercially available. And essentially, a mouse stands in a, on, on a small pedestal, which is in the, on the center of an uh, enclosement, formed by four uh, of an enclosure, which is formed by four uh, computer monitors. The stimulus consists of a sinusoidal grating that moves continuously uh, along the, the different uh, uh, monitors. The mouse responds reflexively to the movement of the stimulus by moving its head in the uh, uh, clockwise and counterclockwise uh, direction. Now, I put together this. Uh, so this is, this is actually the picture of the, of the device. It's, uh, it's still holding <coughs> together. But I, I want to use the uh, handyman's secret weapon. <laughs> and on top here, you can see this, this in, enclosed in this uh, little box is the, uh, it's an infrared camera that we use to, to actually look at the mouse. So the way this works is we use an alternative force choice where the stimulus will rotate in either the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. And the observer in this case, in all the data that I'm going to describe today, Miko, uh, look, using this camera was looking at the, at the mouse without knowledge of which is the direction in which the mouse, uh, in the direction in which the stimulus was rotating. So I have a small animation that, that sort of describes a little bit better how the uh, optimal response uh, works. 
So just imagine yourself that, oops, I'm sorry. So just imagine yourself uh, the mice uh, sitting in the pedestal. And after a brief uh, period of, a, of uh, adaptation, the grading appears. And within five seconds, it begins to rotate. The mouse will respond, will see, will detect the uh, stimulus, and will respond to it. So if it moves to the clockwise, or in this case to the left, they go, their head moves back and moves to the left. If they're going to the right, they'll track and move to the right. <coughs> the job of the observer is using, using the, the, uh, the infrared camera, they will only see the head of the, of the mouse without knowing the direction in which the stimulus is going. Okay, so their job is to determine in which direction the uh, stimulus is going just by observing the mouse. Now we can make life a little harder by changing the difference between the light and dark uh, levels in the stimulus. And now you'll see that these two mice will not, these mice, two mice over here, will do not detect that, that uh, stimulus. So that means that the stimulus is below the threshold, okay? So we can get a good measure of the, in this case, the contrast sensitivity of the mice. Now, the use of, these, of this uh, stimulus uh, is also important because we can also study the sensitivity of the mice to the speed. That is, we can change the speed of the stimulus. You can go fast, slow, or you can go faster. We can also change the spatial composition of the stimulus. In this case, that is the, the separation between the dark and bright stripes. We can go from narrow bands to wider bands. And we uh, estimate the spatial frequency as 1 over the spatial wavelength of that, band, of that uh, gradient. We can also study or determine the sensitivity to temporal frequency. Now, temporal frequency is a little bit harder to explain, but what you can do is perhaps envision looking at this moving uh, rating through a very small window that is, has an opening that is much smaller than the, the, uh, the, the wavelength of, of the um, pattern. Okay? What you will observe is a flickering where the brightness is going to change. And the frequency of that uh, of that flicker will depend on oops, will depend on the uh, temp on the velocity and the spatial frequency of the pattern. So now I'd like to talk a little bit. So these are the pattern the, 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 the patterns that we're going to use. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the retina. This is an image that I borrowed from uh, Dr. Nicolás Cuenca in uh, the Universidad de Alicante in Spain. And this is a cross-section through a primate retina. And it shows, what I want to emphasize is that the, the photoreceptor layer here, you can see the, the rods. You can distinguish them from the cones uh, based on their morphological features. But you can also tell them apart by their uh, using immunohistochemistry by their um, chemical signature. We also have that the rods will connect will connect directly onto a particular class of bipolar cells, these are the rod bipolar cells, that make contact exclusively on this on the on the synaptic terminals of the rods that have this little shape to look like spherules. Okay? The cones, right here, they connect directly onto cone bipolar cells. So they have a slightly different uh, looking terminal. It's called a pedicle. And they connect directly onto cone bipolar cells. So here's a superposition. And then the information that is received by the, by the, the rods and uh, by the uh, bipolar cells is relayed onto amacrine cells and ganglion cells, and then that is translated, uh, transferred onto the brain for further processing. So let's skip this. So let's 
look at some data. So this is this is the first set of data that we obtained. This is looking at the uh, contrast sensitivity of a C57 watt type mouse. And what we have here is on this axis here, this is the intensity of the background. And on this axis is the sensitivity of the mouse for each one of these intensity levels. This is, this is what we call a contrast sensitivity function. And what we see is that it has a threshold of around minus six log candelas per meter squared. And it increases very quickly and then sort of saturates and remains at that level with further increases in intensity. You can notice that it's a very large uh, range of intensities. It covers, in this case, we cover more than, than eight uh, log units. Um, there is not much difference between this, this uh, contrast sensitivity function in terms of the sensitivity uh, when compared to that of human. We can also detect, this is very similar to the levels that we can detect uh, um, as, as shown by some classic studies back in the 1960s. The difference is that miles have a maximum sensitivity which is around eight, nine, whereas humans can have a, a, a sensitivity that can extend all the way up to 100 or 300. So there's, there's, that's one of the biggest difference with mice. Now, as part of this study, we also decided to determine see if we could find what were the contributions of the rods and cones to this contrast sensitivity function. So to do that, we made use of two uh, transgenic mouse lines. The first one, which we labeled and called the rod only, uh, consisted of mice with a point mutation in their G alpha um, subunit of the uh, transducin in cones. Okay, so that rendered those cones uh, dysfunctional. <coughs> so the retinas of those mice only have functional rods. So when we looked at their contrast sensitivities, what we found was that at very low background intensity levels, their sensitivity was very similar or matched closely with that of the controls, it then peaked and gradually de decreased over the, the following uh, four, three or four log units. Next, we decided to test what was the contribution of cones. And to do that, we used another, another line of mice. These are knockout mice with, uh, the, uh, without, uh, fun without the, uh, the G alpha transducing for for the rods, so these mice have only functional cones. And <coughs> their contrast sensitivity had a lower threshold. They were about 100, two log units or 100 fold less sensitive than, than the controls. And their sensitivity increased uh, gradually and then they just, it just kept going up and converged to with the less, similar levels as we had recorded with the, uh, uh, or measured with the, um, with the control mice. So we can now divide or, or, or uh, separate this into different regions. This region here, where we have only cone res uh, rod responses, and uh, we know it, we, we call it the uh, scotopic range of, of uh, intensities. There is a second region. <coughs> with higher intensities in which only the rods only the rods are active from around uh, minus two and further up. Only rods are active and we refer to this as the photopic range and an intermediate range where both rods and cones are contributing to the visual function and we refer to that as the mesopic uh, range. Now these experiments were performed using, sorry about that, were performed using very low spatial and temporal frequencies in the gradient. Okay, and we knew from <coughs> studies, uh, psychophysical studies in humans, that rod vision tends to prefer and respond better to those stimulus. So we repeated these experiments, but now using very high spatial and temporal frequencies in the in, in the stimulus gradient. And this is, this is the response, the contrast sensitivity for the wild type. And now when we looked at the response right here, and when we looked at the response of the rod-only mice, 
we have that the rods just did not, uh, the retinas with only rods just did not respond to this stimulus. Okay, when we repeated the experiment with a cone only retina, now we have that it matched very closely with that of the wild types. So what that means is that in response to very high spatial and temporal frequencies, most of the uh, contrast sensitivity or, or visual function is actually mediated by the cone system. So let's move. With, with that, with that you know, as, a, as a basis, we decided to start studying uh, other uh, um, disorders. And this one was done in, co in collaboration with Padina uh, uh, Abstavsky in Duke. And this is a phenomenal uh, disorder known as pradyopsia. And this is a very rare genetic condition in which the subjects experience a rather uh, big difficulty in detecting fast moving objects. And they also have a hard time adapting to very um, bright backgrounds. It originates from a recessive mutation in the RGS9 and R9AP genes. And um, today we're just going to talk about the changes in uh, uh, mice that have, uh, that are knockout for the R9AP. So we have that R9AP is a key anchoring protein in the uh, gap complex, which controls the inactivation of the G alpha protein in both rods and cones. So that in its absence, in its absence, the rod photoreceptors are very, very slow to recover from the light stimulus. These are um, suction electrode recordings from performed by Marie Burns at UC Davis. And what she found was that the knockout mice, the, the, the the, the rods with the knockout uh, for R9AP had a response to, the, to, to brief flashes of light that were much, much slower than those of the control mouse. So the question now became, does this slower photoreceptor inactivation alter or change the visual sensitivity in mice? Now, because we are looking at temporal aspects, what we, are, what we did next was look at the changes in sensitivity as a function of temporal frequency. Okay, so on this axis here we have temporal frequency, and this is the, on this axis here we just show the sensitivity. Because we are going to compare the R9AP to the control, what we are plotting here is a relative sensitivity. That is a ratio of the sensitivity of the R9AP to that of the control. So a value of one will be will mean that there is no change relative to control. So this graph here shows data that was measured under scotopic conditions. Remember that is light backgrounds that stimulate only and exclusively the rod system. And whereas the one on the right shows the relative sensitivity for the photopic conditions. And what we found was that there was basically no difference under scotopic conditions. So what that means is that having a slower rod response or inactivation really didn't change how well the mice could, could see the, the gradients. Uh, and it did not, we, we tested that for different spatial frequencies and we didn't really see any, any, any real trend. Now when we repeated those experiments under photopic conditions, that is when we activated the cones, what we found was a very different story. We have that for temporal frequencies below 1 or 1.5, there's really, the, the, the relative sensitivities are very, are very close to one, meaning that there's no, no real trend. But for temporal frequencies above one hertz, 1.5 hertz, then there's a very steep and drop in sensitivity. Okay, meaning that in the case of cones, when they're, the, 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 the temporal or the inactivation of their phototransduction cascade is actually limiting the temporal resolution of of the visual system. Now, from anecdotal, uh, anecdotal evidence is that these uh, uh, the subjects that are suffering from this uh, disorder, they have difficulty uh, seeing objects that are moving fast. For example, they would have a hard time detecting a, a basketball. They could not play basketball. They would not be able to see the ball. But they would be able, for example, to go down and ski down, down a, a trail, I'm assuming, if they're not going too fast. 
in the sense that it's only small objects that are moving fast that, that they do have trouble seeing. So now we plotted the data, the relative sensitivities under scotopic conditions, but now as a function of speed. And what we found was that there was a separation and that it did depend on the, the sensitivity depended on the spatial frequency of the stimulus. That is, with very low spatial frequencies, in this case 0 0.064 cycles per degree, we have that the uh, subjects could detect that up to a frequency, a speed of about 20 degrees per second. Whereas, if we now use the uh, uh, grading with a very high temporal frequency, it turned out that the sensitivity would start to decay with lower speeds, the closer to seven or eight degrees per second. So it appears that there is a trade-off in sensitivity and where low spatial frequencies can uh, result in a high speed cutoff, whereas high spatial frequencies like this one results in a very low speed cutoff. Now, this is a stretch, but one could think that small objects are more closely related to high spatial frequencies, whereas larger objects are probably have a much bigger or larger content of low spatial frequencies. Now, the other uh, uh, problem that these patients uh, or subjects uh, experience is that they have a hard time uh, adapting to bright backgrounds. So we run a, a study where now we compare the contrast sensitivity of the control and the R9AP as a function of background intensity. And what this shows here is that with very low backgrounds, the, the, the sensitivity is pretty much the same. It actually sort of overshoots. And then as we get into the photopic uh, levels of light, the intensity tends to go down and, and sort of plateaus in the R9AP. So the question now became, well, are all these uh, effects happening in the retina? And one way to address that is by measuring the uh, ERG, the electroretinogram. This is a non-invasive technique. We can just place an electrode on the eye of the, of the mouse and measure the responses. Now, because most of the effects, as I said before, occur at frequencies that are above 1.5 hertz, we tested the sensitivity, the ERG sensitivity of this mice at 3 hertz. Okay? So we see that with very low background intensities, the response of the wild type and the R9MP are very similar. Okay? We can just go ahead and calculate what is the sensitivity and plot it as a function of background. In this case here, we have that with brighter backgrounds, the, sense the uh, response of the ERG is, is remains pretty large, whereas the response of the R9AP actually decreases substantially. So if we now estimate the sensitivity of the ERGs, we can overlap that with the sensitivity that we measure uh, psychophysically. And we have that there's a pretty good match between uh, the two data. So here we have um, with the black open symbols, this would be the ERGs of the wild type, and we see that actually corresponds pretty well up to around here. Here, uh, over here, it tends to, to actually uh, overshoot with the sensitivity that we measure behaviorally. And uh, the R9P actually does also a pretty good job. This, this point here is a little bit off, but we see that eventually it also comes down and it sort of matches within the, uh, about the same uh, range of, uh, of sensitivities. So in summary, we have that in the R9EP, or in this uh, Bradley Oxygen model, there are no changes in scotopic sensitivity, even though the rods are, are much slower. The changes are exclusively on the photopic range, and only for temporal frequencies that are higher than 1.5 hertz, and we can then extend that to explain why uh, the patients or, or the subjects uh, have a hard time adapting to bright backgrounds and seeing moving objects. And I think that this is a very interesting uh, finding, which is that we can just measure the ERGs and from there uh, actually determine what, what would be 
the, the drop in the behavioral sensitivity. Uh, next, I want to talk about uh, the, the another project that we're uh, performing, uh, running in the lab right now. And this is, uh, we're looking at the uh, early, we're looking at the visual <coughs> changes in uh, diabetic mouse model. And I, I don't think I need to overemphasize uh, the importance of, the, of diabetes, but just point out that early detection of diabetic retinopathy uh, is crucial for the slowing of the progression of the disease and the loss of vision. And Unfortunately, uh, up to now, most of these tests in, in human subjects have been measurements of acuity under photographic conditions. And what I'll show you now is that uh, I think that there's much more to the story. So we're using uh, currently a genetic model of uh, diabetes. This is insulin 2 Akita mice. And again, we tested their sensitivity on their scotopic and photopic conditions. Uh, this would be the special frequency of the stimulus, and this is the sensitivity. And the symbols here shows the progression of the disease, in the sense that we start, uh, the first test is at eight weeks, and we get this sensitivity curve over here. Then we test them again at 12 weeks, at 16 weeks, and by 24 weeks, this is the sensitivity that is left under scotopic conditions. So there seems to be a specific loss in sensitivity to the high spatial frequencies when tested under scotopic conditions. When tested under photopic conditions, we have not really detected any significant changes. Okay? We can now plot this in terms of uh, time. And I just chose two, two representative frequencies, a low spatial frequency, which is 0 0.64, and a high uh, a spatial frequency, which is 0 0.23. And the open symbols here are the controls. And we see that at eight weeks, um, the sensitivities are still pretty much the same between control and diabetic mouse. And the control sensitivity remains pretty much the same throughout the testing period. But we have that within the first 10, 10 or 15 weeks, there's a pretty uh, significant loss in sensitivity to this low spatial frequency. The high, when we tested the high spatial frequencies, what we found was, again, here's the control. And we did not detect any significant change or loss in sensitivity under those conditions. Here's now for the uh, photopic conditions. And um, I'm only showing the effects on the uh, diabetic mouse. But we see, again, that there's almost no change in the slope uh, when measured in terms of the response to sensitivity to low and to high spatial frequencies. So to finish, I think that uh, we, we, we just as a summary, we have a significant, about 30% losses in contrast sensitivity that precede the changes in retinal morphology. And we have that the specific dysfunction of a rod-specific pathway, uh, that the loss is specific to a rod pathway that encodes low spatial frequencies. And this actually opens uh, quite a number of, few of future directions that where we can take this. And one is to try to understand, first of all, see if we can rescue this loss in sensitivity. The second one is to identify what is that dysfunctional pathway. And the third is, well, see if perhaps human patients ex exhibit the same, the same losses in, in sensitivity. Um, as I said before, most of the epidem epidemiological studies so far, what they do is they study acuity under scotopic conditions. And as we study in, in these mice, at least there, there's no change. Certainly not before there are any uh, retinopathy apparent. So all these changes, what, what I forgot to mention, is that all these changes occur before there are any changes in the retinopathy of the mice. So we think that this could actually be a, a predictor of, of impending retinopathy. And I'd just like to finish uh, this picture of Dr. Bargo and some of the, yeah, uh, just mentioned that Yumiko Mina did all the work that I just showed. And some of it uh, was done in collaboration with Duke University. 
uh, Nicole Cuenca is helping us with the anatomy, and some of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, diabetes work is done in collaboration with uh, Alistair Barber at uh, Penn State. Thank you. studies, uh, most of them were carried out in the 80s. Um, the results were not, these studies were not very systematic and the results are very controversial. Uh, most of them, I wouldn't say most of them, but many of them show that there's a loss in high temporal sensitivity, uh, high spatial uh, sensitivity. Uh, all these studies were done with plates, so there is no temporal information. And uh, most of these uh, were actually done with patients that had already uh, very uh, mild um, signs of, uh, of retinopathy. So there are other studies where they look at sensitivity, that is how they, the ability to detect flashes. But I think that this is, this is different in that it actually shows the, that there might be a problem in the way that perhaps in the lateral interactions that are processing information in the inner retina. So the next step that we want to do is not just look at flash ERGs, but rather use uh, pattern ERGs where we can uh, see if we can detect any changes in the inner retina and correlate that. I think that if we do that, 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 that might uh, answer some of those questions. I think the other problem is that to run these experiments, the studies on which demand require that you study scotopic vision, that means that the subject has to come into the clinic and it has to dark adapt for at least 40 minutes before you can test them so that it goes through the dark adaptation process. So I think that that also makes things a little difficult. Thank you, Eduardo. Our, our next speaker is Bill Brunkin. Uh, Gus Abramson uh, got uh, Bill Brunkin and Bob Barlow together several years ago to talk about uh, potential cooperative projects. And it was really Bill and Bob that spawned the concept of the SUNY Eye Institute, which was quickly embraced by Steve Goodman. Uh, at that time, President David Smith had already begun looking at the possibility for the first time in SUNY history of getting the presidents and deans from the four campuses of the medical school and the College of Optometry together to begin to look at working at things as a whole. Um, Bob and Bill spearheaded this project when Bob became ill. Bill has taken over at great personal time and expense to make this project work. Bill recently moved from Tufts to Downstate. Uh, his uh, scientific career at Downstate, I think, will flourish because of the environment there with Doug Lazaro, active experiments in glaucoma and both basic science and, and clinical studies. And also, as the SUNY Eye Institute takes off, uh, this will grow. We are, Bill is spearheading a movement to have submit a P30 this September uh, with all of the five institutions uh, collaborating. So on a personal basis, I, we all owe Bill a great deal of credit for having jumped in and devoted a large block of time to making this thing happen. Putting a group together at five different institutions is uh, labor intensive to say the least. It's my pleasure to welcome Bill Brunkin. Thanks very much, John, for that introduction, and, and also Dr. Goodman for your leadership on the SUNY REACH and in the SUNY Eye Institute. Dr. Smith's been a great proponent for the SUNY Eye Institute, so I'm pleased to come here and sort of represent it and also talk here. Um, and I'm grateful to Dr. Pullman for talking about nitrous oxide because 
one of our fellow faculty members in the SUNY system, of course, won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of nitric oxide. And since I come from downstate, which is where Dr. Hirschkamp was, I can't, I'd get crucified if I went back without mentioning that. So it's a great pleasure. It's also a great pleasure to come here to Bob's home turf. Um, Bob was a force of nature, and like the hurricane named after him, uh, he swept over the Northeast. Unlike the hurricane, he left behind several very strong institutions, not the least of which is the Center for Vision Research. And I'm very grateful for coming up and being able to talk to you all. What we've been interested in recently is the development of, and the lab has taken this tech for about the last 10 to 12 years, the development of the central nervous system, particularly the, the retina, which has been the focus of my 30 years of work. And here is a sort of cartoon going from the neural epithelium to a brain. It's a little bit more dramatic than looking at it at a retina. And there's a tremendous transformation that's taking place from essentially something that's skin-like to what we recognize as brain. And as a result of a three-year sabbatical at the Cutaneous Biology Research Institute, what I've learned is that the brain is, in fact, nothing more than smart skin. Uh, yeah, great. And this regional variation is actually the result of complex processes that we divide into multiple different segments. Neurogenesis, the migration of new neurons, their differentiation, their axon elongation, then elaborating synapses, and then pruning. And there are many things that go into that lots of things that have to do with intrinsic cell signaling and transcription factors, cell-cell interactions to recognize partners, oops, sorry. Uh, now I understand why everyone else was having that. Um, and, and, but what we've been focusing on are the interruptions, they're backwards actually, you say. Um, and and uh, we've been focusing on the interactions between cells and their environment, particularly on the, th the interactions between laminins and naturins. What are these molecules? And, and this actually grew out of that period in cutaneous biology. Laminins form the prominent component of the most recognizable bit of the body that they're in is a basement membrane. And here's a diagram of the basement membrane. We conceive of this as a static structure, but it's anything but static. It consists of a polymer of laminin, which is coupled to a polymer of collagen, and the cross-coupling molecule is this thing called nitrogen. Every single epithelial-derived tissue sits on the basement membrane, and the basement membranes separate the various compartments. The nervous system is no different. It sits on the basement membrane. It's called the pia. And at that interface is the glial imitans. And then, in fact, throughout the entire nervous system is based on components of the basement membrane that are invading with the vasculature. Basement membranes form adhesion sites. They compartmentalize tissues. And they actually provo provide enormous cues, both in these molecules themselves, as well as sinks and traps for for soluble um, morphogens. All right, in terms of laminins, laminin molecule is a, a trimeric molecule. It's a heterotrimer. It's composed of three gene products, an alpha, a beta, and a gamma gene product. They are in this sort of cruciform shape. And what we discovered with Bob Bergeson's lab is that there are, in fact, three unique laminins that are found in the central nervous system. They are composed of an alpha chain, a unique beta, beta 2 chain, and a gamma 3 chain. There are, I forgot to tell you, I'm sorry. There are five alpha chains, three beta chains, and three gamma chains, making potentially 60 different trimers. There is one unique pair, a beta, a beta 3 gamma 2 pair. Those, are, those laminins are called laminin 5. They're what holds your skin on, and they're only found well, they're found in the epidermis as well as in 
the central nervous system. We've discovered that laminin-5 <laughs> is actually the central nervous system. These contain alternate forms of laminins, and the beta-2 chain was first discovered by Dale Hunter in Chow Sainz's lab when it was called S-laminin, and this is absolutely critical for synaptogenesis at the neuromuscular junction. Laminins exert their effects by interacting with laminin receptors, the most famous of which is dystroglycan, and that is a single gene product which is split into two components, an alpha and a beta dystroglycan, and that's coupled to the actin cytoskeleton through dystrophin and eutrophin and other such molecules and integrins. This complex is found in all epithelial cells, it's found in neurons, and what we now know is also components of this complex, and you'll see in a moment, are found at the photoreceptor synapse. Disruptions in this complex lead to a whole host of diseases, including nephropathy, and in fact, a thing called eye, muscle eye brain disease. This is a complex disease that's, called, that's characterized by muscular dystrophy, ocular dysgenesis, and congenital <coughs> disruption of the cortex, which can lead to mental retardation. Okay, what about in the retina? What we've discovered in the retina over time is that there are actually two laminin-containing compartments. There are tr traditional basement membranes here in red. This is Bruce's membrane, and this is the inner limiting membrane, and then these non-basement membrane compartments, and what I mean by this is these are laminin-containing compartments but they don't have any nitrogen and they don't have collagen. So they're slightly different. And you saw a picture from Eduardo who showed you the differences of the, the area in the interphotoreceptor matrix around rods and cones. And in fact, we know that the matrix that surrounds those molecules, those cell types is actually quite different. Okay. So what I'd like to tell you a little bit about is the basement mem the role of the basement membrane laminins in retinal development. And I want to focus on this black cell. You've heard a lot about the photoreceptor today and even the connections to bipolar cells here. And this is the basic retinal structure you've seen several times. This cell no one's mentioned is the Mueller glial cell. It's the leftover progenitor cell. It retains a certain proliferative capacity even in the human retina and it spans the entire neural retina and sits on this basement membrane. And what we know is that by using reverse genetics, we've knocked out basement membrane components, and by knocking out various components of laminins, we can produce a disruption of the peel surface of the inner limiting membrane. Here's wild type. This is just a basement membrane marker. You see nice basement membrane structures. And here's the inner limiting membrane. This is a Mueller glial cell sitting down on the inner limiting membrane. When we knock out beta 2, we begin to disrupt the inner limiting membrane. It's not as nice continuous structure here. And there are some folds on the surface of the retina. But the basement membrane in Bruch's membrane and blood vessel basement membrane is intact. What you can't see here is the, the uh, extra ocular muscle. Gamma 3, that chain partner. There's no effect on basement membrane formation. But when we knock out both chains, we completely disrupt, at least in this region, the formation of the inner limiting membrane. And this is just blood vessel basement membrane. And you can see that the basement membrane surrounding the muscle is intact. This has, sorry, this has consequence for the retina in that now you can see that this process, the cellular process, which we've now identified as Mueller cell, is growing into the vitreous and forming what the ophthalmologist might call an epi or contributing to an epiretinal membrane formation and perhaps the beginning of proliferative vitreal retinopathy. Here you see low power scans of retinas from these different genotypes. What I want to draw your attention to is here is in the compound knockout, you can see that there's a broad disruption of the inner limiting membrane. The central inner limiting membrane is intact. This is, this is developmentally older. And as a, at, during aging, this me membrane fails to form. And what you see as a result of that is a 
dramatic disruption of rectal lamination. This is a young retina at P7. This is a normal wild type appearance. Photoreceptors, ganglion cells here. This is a big blood vessel. Synaptic layers at this relatively young age are relatively um, thin. And here's slightly older, nice OPL and nice thick <coughs> IPL. The retina at this P15 is thrown into this gigantic fold. This is called the rosette. We now believe that this is the result of overproduction of photoreceptors. And you can see that there's a delamination of ganglion cells coming, protruding into the vitreous even at this young age, and this gets considerably worse with age. What's most striking is the disruption of the Mueller cell itself. Here is you're looking at a whole mount of the retina, so you're looking as if you were a beam of light. This is the surface of the retina. This, this in red are blood vessels. In light, perhaps those of you in the front can see this thin sort of sheet light. That's the ILM, which ophthalmologists peel off. And here you see it stained with perlocan, a marker of basement membrane. In the double knockout, it's completely missing in this region. Here is an end view of the Mueller cell end feet. In green, they're stained with glutamine synthetase, and you can see that they surround each of these ganglion cells. There's a nice ring around ganglion cells themselves. In the knockout, those end feet are completely disrupted and end up forming these fibritic tangles. This is a progressive disruption in the Mueller cell development. Here, early on, they seem relatively normal, um, although there are accumulations of their end feet here. There are disruptions by P15 of their apical processes. They're, they are not ending as a nice linear band here at the inner limiting membrane. This is a, probably the beginning of an epiretinal formation. And by P20, they're actually quite fibrotic. In addition to this disruption at the end foot, the Mueller cell is going into gliosis. Here's the wild type of retina stained with glutamine synthetase and GFAP. The GFAP under the wild type conditions are confined only to astrocytes, which line the inner limiting membrane. But in the knockout animal, and this is a little bright on the green, what you should be able to see is a lot of GFAP or red and yellow signaling here indicating a patch of gliosis. In addition to that, at the apical surface, the Mueller cells make a series of tight junctions. In part, those tight junctions use beta-catenin as part of the tight junctional complex. Those are disrupted in these animals, and through those disruptions, cells breach into the subretinal space. So this is a highly disrupted retina. Um, and in addition to these sort of morphological disruptions in the Mueller cell, what you begin to see as well is that the Mueller cell has gone back into the cell cycle. These is wild type, H-matched wild type, this is P17, H-matched wild type and double knockout animals. They are both stained for glutamine synthetase and phospho-H3, a marker of mitosis. There is no mitosis to be seen in the wild type retina, and nearly every Mueller cell has gone back into mitosis. In, in this region of the retina. In addition to that, we now know that these guys are upregulating other cell cycle markers, including uh, P27. P27 is vastly upgraded. It's up by about three, uh, threefold in these animals. And in addition to being just upregulated, there's a shift in where the P27 is expressed. P27 is normally confined to the inner nuclear layer here, and this sort of light is the double label of the DAPI and the P27. But in this retina, you can see it's upregulated, and in addition, it's filling the cytoplasm of the Mueller cell. That transition from nucleus to cytoplasm allows the P27 to interact with the cytoskeleton. It removes it from inhibiting the cell cycle, contributes to the cell going back into cell cycle, and this transition from a nuclear localization, and there's a patch in here, uh, right here, where there are almost no Mueller cell nuclei stained with this stuff, with the P27. That transition from nuclear staining to cytoplasmic staining 
is the same kind of transition you see during metastatic um, development in tumors where the cells are beginning to become invasive. And in fact, what you see here is a large proliferative fibroid-like mass forming on the vitreal surface of the retina. So in sum, what we see with the Mueller cell is you go from this nicely columnar cell, which is at the core of the retina, which nestles all the cells of the retina, all the neurons of the retina are nestled into this nice pore-like cell. It is GS positive, GFAP negative, and not mitotically active. And that cell progresses to a hypertrophied cell, a cell that's going into division. Its nucleus is actually beginning to migrate into the upper regions of the retina. It's sending processes into the vitreal cavity sprouting, it has caused, a, it has lost its zonular adherence, its tight junctions here, allowing breaches into what's really the remnant of the ventricular compartment. And in addition, I haven't shown you these data, but every single neuron of the retina is sprouting in response to this sprouting of the Mueller cell. So the horizontal cells, the bipolar cells, are sending out processes. And what I do want to show you about now a little bit is the, the effect on the photoreceptor because the photoreceptors are losing their synaptic context and those synaptic contexts are falling apart. And all of these sequences are very similar to the sequence of events that take place during retinal detachment. But before I switch over to the synapses, I need to tell you that absolutely everything I've told you about what's going on with the Mueller cell also goes on in the brain of these animals. Um, and, and here's the wild type <coughs> cortex, a perfectly nice laminated cortex, and here's the beta 2 knockout cortex. It's thrown into folds, you see this disruption, and importantly, at the basis of that is also a disruption of the radial glial cells. These are labeled with di I. You see these nicely radial labeled and well-organized radial glial cells. These are the cortical equivalents of the Mueller glial cells. And here in the knockout, they're thrown, there's this large tuft of processes on the surface that's co-localized with a, a patch of ectopic neurons. This mouse has the equivalent of cobblestoneless encephaly. And here you can see that the, that the radial glial cells are ending short of the, the glial limit. All right, so there's a broad disruption. By disrupting the basement membrane, there's a broad disruption of this Mueller glial cell. And that gives us an indication of what the role of the basement membrane um, in retinal, retinal and CNS development. And we actually now know that anything that's involved in that laminin complex, the laminin, the laminin receptors or, mo or molecules that modify the laminin receptors, actually produce very similar phenotypes. So it's a sort of brain form of a set of skin diseases called epidemolysis pullosa. But what about the synapses? And the synapse stuff is actually where Bob and I began to do some collaborative <laughs> stuff. Um, and it's only fitting because much of this, the molecular organization of the synapse was actually done in my lab by a former graduate student of Bob's Merriman. In these same mice, we've done ERG and various sort of analysis of the beta-2 knockout animal. And what you can see very quickly here is that here's an ERG from a normal mouse, a nice A wave and B wave. So this is the response coming out of the second order neurons. You can see that in the laminin knockout animal, that B wave is nearly gone. And here's the log intensity function. Here's the nice nonlinear transfer function of the photoreceptor to bipolar cell synapse that we heard Dr. Perlman talk to us about. And here is the linearized function, more or less linearized function, in the beta-2 knockout animal. So the transfer of the synapse is not being able to be stabilized. The compound knockout has a very similar phenotype. It also loses its B wave, and its B wave is actually considerably reduced. These data were done much later, slightly different set of animals, different ages, different person doing them, 
so that you didn't get quite as nice B wave results. But in addition to the B wave result, the A wave here is also considerably reduced. And I can talk to people about, I think that this is an effect actually not in the photoreceptor per se, but maybe in the Mueller cell. What about the synapse? Well, we first took a look at the synapse, and here's a wild type synapse here. And this is the typical photoreceptor synapse. It's characterized by this large ribbon-shaped structure here, which is the output component. Here are two horizontal cells, and here is a bipolar cell. The photoreceptor actually wraps around, clamping off this space, and here it is diagrammed, the ribbon, horizontal cells, and the central bipolar cell. This is what we see in over 40% of the ribbons, and we've counted about 1,000 of them in the knockout animal. There are these floating ribbons. There's no sign of any postsynaptic element. There are about 30%, you see one or two postsynaptic elements, and only 7% of the time do you see a mature synapse like this. So this led us to suggest that, in fact, that there was a laminin in the synaptic cleft, that the laminin then held the synapse together. And specifically, we predicted that there were laminin receptors that were then coupled to the ribbon and also scaffolding the MGLUR6, the transmitter receptor. And in the interest of time, what we first did is we, we used the not laminin. We first actually said, is there laminin in the synapse, in, in the synapses? You can't do this anatomically. We did it biochemically. We isolated laminins from the, some synaptosomes. This is hippocampus. And here is beta-2 laminin, four different antibodies to it. And then this is just a positive control. And here are the alpha and beta and gamma partners of that molecule. What are the receptors? The bottom line is that all of the receptors that you know, that one might know about in skin, are expressed in the photoreceptor terminal. Here is, oops, sorry. Here is one of them. This is collagen 17. This is a transmembrane collagen. It's part of the adhesion complex for dermal adhesion. And here you can see it co-localized with a couple of different mark, uh, with SV2 here to mark the the photoreceptor terminals, and here's the strophin, which is expressed postsynaptically, and you can see that association. We know that collagen 17 binds laminin. There's two different ways to do that, um, one of which is with a beta-2 column here, and another one was with immunoprecipitation. These are the controls, and here you can see beta-2 pulling down the collagen 17. In addition to this kind of receptor, dystroglycan, which is the receptor in muscle, is expressed. And what Mary Minglopis uh, noticed, and this was from our older data, here's the expression profile of both dystrophin and dystroglycan expression. Both of these molecules come on much later than the laminin molecule. We let that, we suggested that that meant that they weren't really the key organizing molecules. What Mary realized is that the timing of the turning on of the dystroglycan in particular was actually the timing of the bipolar entry into the OPL. And she set about proving that, oh, that bipolar cells express dystroglycan. Here's her co-localization of dystroglycan with MGLUR6. This is the transmitter receptor that's found on, the, on one class bipolar cells, the on bipolar cells. She then showed that dystrophin, the scaffolding molecule for dystroglycan, so dystroglycan couples to this dystrophin thing, and these are perfectly well co-localized. Dystrophin co-localizes with MGLUR6. It does not co-localize with, with proteins that label the ribbon, which is in fact the release site, so this is all pointing to a postsynaptic expression of MGLUR6. Long story short is that we have several different receptors on the presynaptic side. In the photoreceptor, we see collagen 17, a bunch of different integrants, a few scaffolding molecules, and on the postsynaptic side, we see dystroglycan and dystrophin. 
the interesting thing, the thing where there's synergy with what Eduardo and Yumiko are continuing, is dystroglycan's ability to bind laminin is actually regulated by glycosylation. And in fact, one of the most powerful producers of eye-brain muscle disease is a molecule called fucatin, which is um, the main form of the congenitally derived eye brain muscle disease in Japan, which is called Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy, and that's a failure to glycosylate glycogen. All right, so how does the deletion of laminin affect, let's just skip past this, how does the deletion of laminin affect the photoreceptor synapse? What that biochemical data that I skipped past says is that all the markers are expressed. So the differentiation program has not been altered. But what has been altered is the organization of the synapse. The question is, is it across the synapse or within the synapse? The ribbon, and these are two different markers of the ribbon complex, bassoon and kinesin, continues to be formed in the photoreceptor. And they continue in the knockout. This is the beta-2 single knockout. Their shape is different, and we'll see why in just a second. But what is this rub? So this is not altered. So the cis organization, that is the presynaptic organization, confined to the presynaptic component, does not seem to be organized. What is, or what is disrupted is the transsynaptic organization. Here's the soon labeled in red. And m 6 the transmitter, the glutamate transmitter on that on by both cell dendrite. And you see that there's nice apposition of release and recipient site. And in the knockout, that that's disrupted. And what's specifically disrupted is the anatomical arrangement. The same, too, can be said about the laminin receptor. Here's bassoon and integrin alpha-3. And you see that there's a lot of nice white associated with the ribbon. And opponent to that ribbon complex are these green patches of m 6 In the knockout, what you begin to see is that the ribbon looks either blue or red. And those are indicating that we believe are indicating that the integrin and the bassoon are coming apart. This is just some biochemical data saying that we can pull down alpha-6 with beta-2. It's acting like a receptor. All right. Here's another example. This is now bassoon with dystroglycan. So this, although it looks just like the m 6 is just reinforcing the concept that the dystroglycan is expressed in the on bipolar cell. And here is dystroglycan with m 6 showing that nice co-localization. Dystroglycan is changing its distribution in the knockout animal. It's in fact way down-regulated. This cleavage and is a result of the turnover in this glycan. And you see this in a variety of forms of muscular dystrophy, where this glycan is, in fact, losing its attachment to laminates. And uh, here, you, what you see is a complete loss of co-localization, or nearly complete loss of co-localization of this glycan and m 6 in the knockout showing that this complex on the postsynaptic side is coming apart. And this is further evidence showing the postsynaptic disruption. Here is dystroglycan and, and uh, beta dystroglycan and dystrophin co-localized well. Dystrophin and m 6 co-localized well in the wild type, and that co-localization is being disrupted. So we see apposition between the pre- and postsynaptic side falling apart. The presynaptic complex is relatively stable. The postsynaptic scaffolding complex is, however, falling apart. And there is a particular loss of this isoform of dystrophin. Um, dystrophin has five different isoforms. This is the 266 isoform. The same kind of process can happen in, in the, uh, the central nervous system. We showed that the same things go on, that were going on at the photoreceptor also take place in the hippocampus. The advantage of hippocampal neurons is that we can make them make synapses in culture. We can't do that with photoreceptor and bipolar cell. Well, you can, but it's hard. So we weren't able to do it. What we wanted to know is whether or not the, the laminate needed to be provided by the neuron. 
for the pre and if the neuron on the presynaptic or the postsynaptic side. So we took mixed cultures where we derived wild type cells from an e, um, a GFP labeled, ubiquitously labeled mouse, our, our neurons from hippocampuses from the knockout animal, we mixed them together and we theorized by mixing these together, we could count the number of synaptic boutons, that is input synapses, on green neurons and on not green neurons. And then if we got equal numbers, we would know that perhaps equal relatively high numbers, that there might be a glial source if these were, that um, it's possible if that there was a presynaptic source, since we didn't know the identity and we saw that these were down compared to, um, how did we do this? I mean, this is now old, I'm sorry. Well, the important thing is that if we saw a difference between those those presynaptic boutons on green neurons versus the null neurons, we would be able to say that the laminin was being supplied by the postsynaptic neuron. And in fact, this is indeed what we found. There was a significant, significant reduction of synaptic boutons that the synapses made on knockout neurons, suggesting that the knockout, that the postsynaptic site had to supply the laminin. Um, and that is certainly the case in the neuromuscular junction. The, at the neuromuscular junction, the muscle provides the beta-2 laminate to stabilize its synapse. So what these data have suggested is that there is, in fact, laminin in the synaptic cleft. This is a poor diagram. I, I do have to get a better one. There's laminin in the, in the synaptic cleft. Its role is to scaffold these complexes on the photoreceptors on the presynaptic side, that's the release mechanism. The ribbon, it helps to anchor the ribbon at the release site. And on the postsynaptic side, it anchors a laminin receptor, a scaffolding molecule, and the presynaptic and the uh, transmitter receptor. When we take the laminin away, all these components are expressed. But the ribbon floats free. It's still associated with synaptic vesicles. It is just released from the membrane. And the components of the postsynaptic apparatus, the recipient apparatus, are still expressed. They are just simply not in apposition any longer. All right, so I've shown you that basement membrane laminins contribute to the architecture of the brain. They stabilize the radial glial cells, particularly at the radial glial, the, the glial limitans. What we now know is that they are absolutely critically important for also the expression of aquaporin channels and potassium channels, so they're terribly important in the retina for water transport through the mural glial cells. This all has, I believe, clinical consequence for the practice of ILM stripping. There may be, we may be inducing some changes in the cells under the retina that get stripped, but that we, that we need to do some more experiments to show. And they are probably certainly contributing to the congenital diseases we see that are called high brain muscle disease. We also now know that like the neuromuscular junction, the photoreceptor synapse is the integrity of it, we believe is lamin independent. There are specifically different laminin receptors on the presynaptic and the postsynaptic side, and they stabilize the, the synapse. And in fact, that very well may be modulated by glucose levels. So, and, oh, and, and of course, these are the people that actually did the work. So I currently have a group of very nice students in the laboratory. These are some graduated postdocs. Merriman Block that came down to Boston when the lab was at Tufts and joined in. She was Bob's student along with Mary Pierce. Thank you very much.
in myelin, myelin uh, sheathing or in laminin? Is the laminin is in the myelin? myelin? Oh, absolutely. So laminins absolutely contribute to the ability for oligodendrocytes to myelinate axons. And there are a whole host of laminin-dependent mutations that cause, my, that cause a failure of poor myelination. The laminin that's mainly involved there is an alpha-2 or mericin, and these, there's a mouse model for that, and it does cause disease. The person who's doing the best work on that is actually also a SUNY faculty member. She's at SUNY Stony Brook, and her name is Holly Caliganato, and she's doing some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Does it, does it follow up with is yep. there a disruption of electrical, uh, I might say authenticity, when you um, get the sheathing right? Oh, no. I believe the issues are, the issues are all on the glial cell side. There are disruptions in the proteins that are at the node of Ronfier that are sealing the junction off. I don't know that anyone has looked to see if there are scaffolding issues about the channels that are concentrated at the nodes, for in, you know, so I, I just don't know because what we know, what we know that laminins do in muscle is they bind to dystroglycan and they help stabilize various channels in the muscle membrane. And so, when in one form of muscular dystrophy, Marison dependent muscular dystrophy, the muscle membrane itself is no longer as stable in the result of the force of contraction, and the cells are dying off. That's all mediated by laminin dystrophin, um, sorry, laminin dystroglycan dystrophin, then this large complex that I didn't even talk about, these um, sarcoglycans, and Kevin Campbell has done all this work, and that corrals ion channels, and, and probably some forms of that are happening don't know, and it's not been well studied. This is also all happening in Bruce's membrane in the RP, I'm sure. I want to thank um, Bill, Eduardo, Barry, and Ido for excellent presentations and for helping us celebrate the life and times of Bob Barlow. Uh, I also want to thank Steve Goodman for making this possible, Barb Ames, Carol Miller for, as Bill said, the ones who actually do the work. So uh, thank you one and all, thank you for coming, I appreciate it.